a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Anybody? There's Molly, folks. That means your friends, the Goldbergs, are here. Brought to you by Does, the new kind of soap for everything in your watch. First, let's drop in on the Dozen family. Well, there's Daisy Dozen, home from her high school class in dramatics. She's telling Ma. I've decided, Ma. I'll be the world's greatest living actress. Mm, that's real nice, Daisy. I'll devote my life to my art. Mm, well, could you spare a minute to take this does over to the Palmer? She's never tried does. Okay, Ma. Ah, oh, I go on wings of lightning. Don't run your legs off, Daisy. Just tell her that it's a new kind of soap for everything in the world. I shall say, here in yon red box is does. One soap for all your washing. Rag rugs, towels, rayon undies, overalls, everything. Gracious, all you have to say is does, does everything. Why, it's just wonderful, even for Pa's dirtiest work shirts. Oh, work shirts. Wherefore art thou work shirts? Well, wherever they are, dear, does will clean them easy without a bit of hard scrubbing. I declare I never saw soap get clothes clean easier than does, does. All this and more does, does. That's right. Tell Mrs. Palmer does get the grimiest towels where it can be. Honestly, she won't see a whiter wash. You don't forget to tell her this same does is safer for the pretty colors she washes. Fear not, Mother dear. I'll tell her she can wash the rainbow in does. Oh, nonsense, Daisy. Just say colors stay bright longer with does. Yet it can't be beat for getting towels, really. What? Ah, does. Telling of thy wonder shall be the start of my career. <laughs> Lamb says does sure does everything. Well, does does everything on wash day, that's sure. In fact, Does is the only leading granulated wash day soap that gives longer life to colors, plus unsurpassed whiteness and real cleaning power for the grimiest clothes. Try Does, D-U-Z. It does everything in the wash. And now, the Goldbergs. The expert Molly called in on her little problem is ready to leave. But just what light he's going to throw on Anne Franklin is an open question. Molly has high hopes and great confidence in Dr. Cather. She feels that he, more than anyone, might be able to tell just what is driving Anne to help break up Florence and Eugene's marriage. Anne is in the ambiguous position of being a friend of the wife and secretary to the husband. And Molly just doesn't know how to get to the heart of the problem. The psychiatrist should be able to discover hidden motives. But, as Jake wants to know, how can he discover them at the dinner table? Well, Dr. Cater is leaving, and listen. Goodbye. Good night, Dr. Cater. Goodbye, Dr. Cater. Lay down for the door. Don't open up on Dr. Cater. Close the door, Molly. There's a dress. Goodbye. Bye. I didn't know what for the all this jumping. All this jumping. Tell me, Anne, did you have a nice evening, huh? Dr. Cater is a very interesting man. You know him well? Well, uh, I, I know him uh, quite well. Quite well, I know him. I know his father and I know his wife. I hope she deserves him. Did you see my book, Rosie? I think you took it upstairs when you went up there. Oh, perhaps I did. Thanks. You are you going to bed? I'll go up and talk to Florence for a while. Good night. Uh, I'll be down for a glass of milk later, if that's all right. Well, why not? Why not? She hopes Dr. Cady's wife deserves him. Did you hear that? So what? Maybe she thinks nobody deserves anybody. Maybe that's her psychosis. Don't be the diagnostician. Did Dr. Cater tell you anything more? Dr. Cater's going to call me, he said. Mm-hmm. David? No. David? So? Dr. Cater's going to call me. He didn't say nothing. He couldn't say. He couldn't say privately. How, how could he? Uh, excuse me, Molly. I'm afraid the whole thing is foolish. I'm glad you feel like I feel. Uh, how can a man, a man, oh, like a doctor, how can a doctor just by sitting and, and talking find out why, why my Florence and Eugene are being divorced? Isn't it nonsense, isn't it? 
And just by talking, he, he's going to find out if Anne is responsible. And why? And why? No, sir. Oh, it's a science. Psychology is a science. Questions and answers is a science. Yes, Pa. Questions and answers. That's a quiz game. Not a science. Oh, that's a quiz game. Not a science. Uncle, all right, Rosalie. Quiz, quiz game, quiz game. Rosalie, please. They, they don't, don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. They, they don't understand. They don't understand. The person has to believe what they don't believe. You believe? I believe tremendously. Yes. Why? Tell me why. Because, Pa. Uh, I'm asking Mama. And Papa is asking Mama. I understand it in the way that I understand things. I didn't went to college. I didn't got an AAA, you're a BBB, a CCC also not. I didn't got an issue. But I understand the way I understand. And, and, and I know for myself what the mind is. It's the conscious and the subconscious. Yes. Mom is answering my question. Mom is answering the question. So the, there, there's the conscious and the unconscious. Why well, not? Nonsense. Nonsense. How, how can you be conscious when you're unconscious? There are emotions inside of you that you are not aware of. I'm always aware of every emotion. Excuse me. Give any psychiatrist a few facts about a person, and he can tell you anything that... Give me facts, and I can tell you all yeah, Give me facts, and I'll tell you all that. All that, Rosalie. 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 They want facts. Papa wants facts. Yeah. Uncle David wants facts. Take down the pencil. All right, take, take, take down, down the pack. Take down Rosalie, the pack. Then take a pencil. Oh, here, here's a pencil. Here's a pencil. And, 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 and take down the pack. All right, and write. Listen, listen, listen and, and, and write, and write, and we'll make a map. A map? Is this geography? Why not? Why not? There's a geography of mountains and rivers and cities, of course. I'm not saying not. But there's a geography of the mind also, too, Jake. In the mind, there are deserts, and in the mind, there are green valleys. And in the mind, there are high mountains from which a person can see a whole life. And in the mind, there are dark places, Jake, where nothing at all can be seen. So there are maps too, Jake. And we have to mark maps on with a pencil, on those maps and pick out a way across, like Columbus did on the wide, wide ocean Atlantic. Please, don't philosophize with philosophy, Molly. Give me facts, not mountains and rivers. Excellent. All right. Philosophy. All right. Philosophy. All right. All right. Number one. All right. Facts, Rosalie. We will put down the facts. Please. Number one. You got it? Mm-hmm. Right. Number one. Number Anne one. and Eugene went to college together. Fact number one. Number one. Number one. Fact number one. Is that number one? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Now, number one. Don't squeeze on the paper. Write big. Number two. Somebody at school was in love with it. Rosalie, please. Rosalie, please. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the facts. I'm giving the facts, and you write the phrases. I, I guess I want you to get them all in the proper order. I now. got in the proper order. I said, number one, what? What did I say? I said, Anne and Eugene went to college together. Right? Mm-hmm. They were on the campus, and then they were uh, together on the college. Number one. Number two, somebody in school was in love with Anne. Right? Yes. Is that right? All right. Now, number three. Number three. Yes. Number three. Fact number three. Number three. She didn't marry the boy that loved her. And she went to the publishing business with Eugene. And Eugene wanted to turn over the publishing business to her. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. What? You, you, you didn't know, David. You didn't know Eugene wanted to retire and go with Florence and his children to some quiet place just to write books? Oh, who told me? Uh, how should I know? So why didn't he? I don't know. I don't know. That, 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 that's the question. That's the question. That's why I want to speak to Dr. Cater. Florence said because Anne couldn't run the business without him. So why didn't you give the business? Is it everything, money? Anne didn't run the business. So why didn't he... Wh- May- maybe because he, he, he feels that Anne is responsible for the business. And Eugene feels obliged to her. So, so what's that got to do with psychology? They don't understand. I mean, you have to be a doctor to figure out. What? What, what do you mean, what? What, David? What? You said you have to be a doctor to figure out. You, you, you said you would know, so I'm asking you what? I'm asking you what? Does that answer for you why Anne is pushing the divorce? It's answers. Molly, please. It answers. What, Uncle David? What? It answers that Eugene is not free. He is... It's more, David. It's more. It's not only Eugene. 
why don't Anne want to free herself from Eugene? Partners in business can be married to each other also. I'm going to ask Florence why she didn't tell me that Eugene wanted to retire. I don't. I will. Molly, please. Molly, please. Molly, please. Molly, please. Molly, please. Excuse me, Anne. Just a minute. I'll be right in. Oh, I'll have it, Mrs. Goldberg. I, I think that's for me, please. Hello? I, I believe it's yes. for me. It's Dr. Cater. Is it for me? No, it's for me. Yes, Dr. Cater. Dr. Cater, what? Yes. Oh, yes. I have. I could. Why not? Of course not. I told you. I'll tell you again, surely. What, any time you say. Well, it depends. On you, of course. <laughs> Goodbye. I promise. Do you? Goodbye. I'm having dinner with Dr. Cater tomorrow night, so don't prepare anything for me, please. No, no, I, I won't, then. Good night. Good night. Ma, well, why does Dr. Cater want to see Anne again? Suppose a, a second treatment. Well, just what the Goldberg conception of psychology is, no one will ever know, but their conception of helping others is clear enough. And tomorrow may very well show the way. You know, Molly Goldberg has her own way of doing things, just as we all have. My friend Pa Dozum has, too. He even has an idea on how I should talk about does. Pa said, listen, son, all you need to say is does does everything. I know, but Pa, ladies ought to know does is a new kind of soap. And it does their whole wash, from grimy overalls, streaky towels, mm. to pretty colored rayon slips. Why, compared to other leading granulated wash day soaps, does gives you greater safety for the colors you wash, Plus, unsurpassed whiteness for towels and real cleaning power for the tough pieces. Does, does everything covers all that. Well, you mean I can't say... Nope. Well, not even... Nope. Okay, Pa. Does, does everything in the wash. Ah, oh, but here's a reminder. You better let me get in. Okay. Friends, if your dealer's out of does, you'll have more soon. Meanwhile, don't waste does. You know, soap contains vital war materials, so always put clothes to soak in clear, cool water before washing. See that every bit of does you use does more. Be sure to listen to the next episode of The Goldbergs. Molly and Cater exchange names and find one in common. This is Clayton Collier speaking and reminding you to do as the dozens do. Let does, the new kind of soap, do everything in your watch. psalmist said, When I awake, I am still with thee. For the child of God, seeking the presence of the Lord is essential as each day begins. To help you in starting this day with God, we offer a brief devotional meditation from morning and evening, a collection from the pen of one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This morning's text is found in John chapter 17 and verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Behold the superlative liberality of the Lord Jesus, for he hath given us his all. Although a tithe of his possessions would have made a universe of angels rich beyond all thought, yet was he not content until he had given us all that he had. It would have been surprising grace if he had allowed us to eat the crumbs of his bounty beneath the table of his mercy. But he will do nothing by halves. 
He makes us sit with him and share the feast. Had he given us some small pension from his royal coffers, we should have had cause to love him eternally. But no, he will have his bride as rich as himself, and he will not have a glory or a grace in which she shall not share. He has not been content with less than making us joint heirs with himself, so that we might have equal possessions. He has emptied all his estate into the coffers of the church, and hath all things common with his redeemed. There is not one room in his house, the key of which he will withhold from his people. He gives them full liberty to take all that he hath to be their own. He loves them to make free with his treasure, and appropriate as much as they can possibly carry. The boundless fullness of his all-sufficiency is as free to the believer as the air he breathes. Christ hath put the flagon of his love and grace to the believer's lip, and bidden him drink on forever. For could he drain it, he is welcome to do so, and as he cannot exhaust it, he is bidden to drink abundantly, for it is all his own. What truer proof of fellowship can heaven or earth afford? When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each morning at this same time for Morning and Evening. The greatest story ever told. Presented by the Good Year Tire and Rubber Company. upon a teaching that forth in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, a teaching from the greatest love ever lived. The city of Jerusalem and the faint pink light of early morning bathed the walls of the city in a soft glow. Now the light slants across the golden roof of the temple, giving added color to its own ornament. The great city begins to stir and wake from the quiet of night. But there are a few men who have long been awake and have already considered serious business. Now, for example, a captain of the temple guard faces his superior officer at the act. So you sat for a long time. There is one thing that you keep me. You have a tongue? Ask. Yes, sir. All that you told me regarding the uh, prophet Jesus in Galilee. Surely you tell me that for special purpose. Have you ever known me to talk in vain? That's why I ask. What am I to do about it? You are to go to Galilee to observe this man, to ask about him, to gather as much information as you can, and then report back here to me. But I am an officer of the temple guard. I have no power in Galilee. Galilee is so good, I have not asked you to see the prophet, only to observe him. So I do not see what right I have in Galilee. They say you should obey without questioning. It will disturb you not to know, get it? In Galilee, I am without authority. If this would be trouble... I must know how to explain my presence. There is something in what you say, a great deal. But something. A man, A very clever man, oh, sir. Vigilant and persistent to carry out of your duties. And wily enough to learn more than you ever intended that you know. Surely, sir, if an officer of the temple guard is not alert and vigilant, he cannot carry out his duties. And if he is alert and vigilant, he can gather enough information to assure himself of promotion. He got it. So you know that I serve to the best of my ability? Oh, of course, I 
Well, I will promise you this. Bring us back what we want to know, and you will have your permission. Yes. You and Caiaphas? Yes, you had his word, too. So the high priest wishes to know about this Jesus of Nazareth. And if he does, then he surely wants to know nothing good. If he's evidence to use against the man, he considers him dangerous. Don't worry. With the promotion in the offering, I should be sure to find what you want. You can depend on me. I have always known that, they say. When would you leave? As soon as my servant can pass our things to the journey. A good idea of taking someone with you. A witness to the event your word is disputed by the others here. Of course. Well, Asa, good luck, Tom Vincent. Luck? The luck is in being chosen. From now on, I'll make my own luck. Good morning, sir. <laughs> To be able to make a journey to Galilee, I'm just proud of my service to you. It will not be a vacation, David. Remember that. Uh, I know that, but still, I have family in Galilee, and I have not seen them in some years. My, my cousin Jared, for instance. Where's my sister, Sam Malik? Jared and Malik are missing. They're not allowed for social activities. In fact, it was secret. That's why I had you pack for me clothes other than my uniform. He goes, Tom? You might as well use the word. In Galilee, I must secure evidence of the man and then return as quickly as possible. A man? Which man? A fool. A prophet. But evidently a successful one. He's given the high priest cause to worry. Well, one man's trouble is another fortune. I shall secure promotion out of this. You, David, will have a little extra money to spend right now on. You seem very sure this time, sir. I am. If you find out what the high priest wishes to know, and then... This master would better be careful. Sir, did you say the master? Yes, what are you? Why do you look so distressed? It's sure that you have not found that it's done. Who's sure are you? It's me, man. What's the matter, you David? Your face is going white. Some people say I need to fall off your donkey. What is it? It's said, please, before going into it, I'm not stopped here. Don't be a fool. We can turn you around. I'm not stopped here to talk over such matters with you. This is an important journey to me. The quicker it's over, the better. Then we'll reach the city gate. Come on, sir. For just a few minutes. All right, then we we'll reach the gate. Here. This is the smart hood, David. Yes, sir. One stop. I'll be smart first and help you. Yes, sir. No, 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 sir. Now, David, what's the meaning of this? Why does it need such a meeting to interrupt my journey to argue such a matter with you? The one who first told me. What was talking in preparation for the journey? I didn't know. Didn't know what? That all this had to do with the master. And what difference can it make now that you do know? Sir, you do not understand. My cousin Jared, the one I mentioned to you, you remember? Yes, I remember, David, but come to the point of no time. My cousin Jared, she has a daughter. And she was dead. Yes, dead. And so she would have remained if the master had not raised her. So, you don't believe that, do you? But it, it happened. It did happen. I know it to be true. That's the girl. The girl was not dead. She was a saint, perhaps. The mourners were already in the house. She was dead. I don't believe it. So I give you my word that it happened. So perhaps it would be bad for you not to go to Galilee. Surely you would not want to be harmed to a good man, an innocent man. A good man? If the high priest has something against him, he cannot be such a good man. I've been told that there's a man who hears his teachers and sees the effects of it upon the people. They say he's dangerous, evil, that he seeks power for himself. And you believe it? I intend to find out. In the process, I get my perfect promotion. Okay. Get back from your donkey, David. We continue with our journey. And I warn you now, if you reveal the purpose of my mission to anyone, you'll suffer for it. Yes, sir. And we must make up the first time. And when we arrive in Galilee, we will go about as private citizens, making plays. <laughs> I've heard 
that you know the master. It comes with feeling, from close to him. But you know him better than anyone else here in the Mayest. Is that true? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. And tell me, woman, what kind of things did he teach you? I had heard of him many times during my long journey. And though no one else could hear me, I felt sure that he could. Somehow I knew. Uh, what did he teach, woman? I was trying to tell you how it happened. Yes, yes. Then get on with it. There was nothing anyone could do for me. I had tried every possibility I'd heard of, but no one could help me. So I said to myself, he will help me. I know it. And so, weak as I was, I left my bed in my house at the years that he had come here to a And then I went out and lived too. There was a great crowd gathered about me. And I made my way through it. And believe me, sir, if I had not had faith that he could hear me, I would not have had the strength to insist on it. And then you did, what did you hear in peace? Nothing, sir. Nothing? Then why do you tell me all this? David, this woman can be of no help to me. Why did you hear? Sir, you have not heard me say. Then get on with it, woman, but quickly, do you hear? Sir, I, I am doing the best I can. <laughs> Please, woman, tears do not help. Now tell me. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Yet, as I grew close to him and looked upon his face for the first time, I realized suddenly that he was thanked by God. There was no doubt of it. Thanked by God, hmm? Yes, sir. And I asked myself, who am I that I dare ask him to hear me? I am nothing. I am unworthy, I said to myself. So I did not ask him. Instead, I pressed close to him and reached out to touch the hand of his hand. Indeed. Yes, sir. And at once he asked, who touched my toe? Now, this was strange, that there was a great crowd pressing about him. Who should not have felt my touch? And what he did, he did. Do not make it sound so important, woman. But it was. And that is what I felt in my knees before him and confessed it with me. And that? He reached out to me. Sir, he reached out to touch me and raise me up from the ground. And he said, I oh, has made me whole. He said that, hmm? Yes, sir. And so it was. From that moment on, I have been healed. He cannot know what to do. He cannot. Unless you have been here as long as I was. Of course, woman. But tell me, what did you hear him teach? Many things. Many, many things. But the one which I love best is this. I read it that men should be to you. Do you even say it to them? Since that day, I have lived by this teaching. I see. Um, thank you, woman, for coming here with my servant. See me? Of course, the merely to hear something tell you what you have said and done is not enough. You should go to ruin yourself. Oh, I am. I've no doubt of it. David, say the woman out. Yes, sir. This way, woman. When you have seen him, when you have stood in his holy presence, then you will know all there is to know about him. I thought you never stopped talking. So, David, we have come by our first piece of evidence. I know that it would impress you. And the woman faced me to Did you see her eyes? The way they came. The way her tears whistled in me. She did say something that was very interesting. He is sent by God. Oh. Yes, David, I'm to notice that in my soul. Woman, no. Master sent by God. Yes. But would it not also be fair to make that he healed the thing? You cannot know how sick she was. Women with such an active imagination might only have thought that she was sick. Yet after she found she was better, surely it should be noted in your report. David. Yes. You seem to forget that I was the one who was sent to report. You will keep your observations to yourself. Now I've heard enough here in the mayor. Tomorrow at dawn, we will stop at the next time. We will find more people who know him and heard him speak. You will find him for me. As you say, sir. There's no need to stop, David. You're a servant. You do as you're commanded to do. Sir, I... 
I would like to say this. Yes? Yeah? While we have been here in America, I have seen him talk to my cousin Jerry. So it is true, his daughter was dead, and she was then. I do not accept that as evidence of any kind. It's a story. The fool's like you to believe. Sir, the master does only good. This poor woman you just saw, he healed her after a lifetime of sickness. Is that not a blessed thing? The church of some kind. What he teaches is what makes him dangerous to piety. That is what I must find out. So tomorrow we go on to the next time. Sir, there are no questions. Nothing. Only orders that you will obey. Is that understood? Yes, sir. It is understood. <laughs> I do not see why it's necessary for me to go to find the man who could have brought him to me. Mm-hmm. So he was suspicious. He told me. Mm-hmm. You can talk to him here in the marketplace. He's a mess of his place. I see. What is his place? Uh, that one there. Good. I will find out what I wish to know. Come along. Milton. Good day. Good day, sir. Can you speak to him? I have some time. I think you can be able to get him a sentence. They say these are the best. Yes, an apple. The season is a good mystery. They are uh, plumping and ripe. I'll have it. Good time. Thank you. Tell me, Milton, I hear that you're a distinguished man here in our bella. No, distinguished. Oh, no, sir. I've heard about you. You may have heard about me, sir, but I, I am not distinguished. I am fortunate. Very fortunate. You have been chosen by God as an instrument to which you so kindly to look at. God uh, chose you, didn't he? No, 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 no. Yes, and the day I die, I shall read the voice he gave me to pray to. The voice he gave me? Yes. So you would not know what to look at me now, but many weeks to go, this poet man was useless. He was honest, but he was nothing. And now you will tell me it was the master who uh, healed you. No, no, no. Is it not a wondrous thing? A miracle at the hands of God himself? A wondrous thing, a miracle. Somebody tired of hearing these things. Magic, witchcraft, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Only for the of the master, I think. It doesn't one. Tell me this. What does he teach you? I'd like to know that. I remember very, very well to me, Chuck. I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. This he taught me, and thy words were a child. Words, empty words. Not if men put them to you, sir. He spoke about him, those strangers and strangers. I think the man's a solid, and he says what's all of you. Now, you, you better listen to me. <laughs> yes, sir. It seems to be dangerous for people like you to make such claims on his account. Now, be truthful with me. What did he really do to you? I only knew this thing. Once I was deaf and dumb, now I can hear him speak. He won't be sad, too. Oh. Come, David, let's get away from here. I can't understand it. Each one of them with another impossible story. It often been said that no good can come out of Galilee. You speak to such fools that you see why. Sir, I know you are angry. But did you see the man who spoke to me? Oh, sir, he was not mad. No, oh, he believed what he said. That's why I have to add another note to my report. The master has bewitched these people. Yeah, it's hard to make good use of that. Bewitched them? The same in his He's lost. I would see for myself what a strange spell this man cast. Yes. Next thing for you to do is to find out where he is. You would go to him? You would question him? Mm-hmm. I wish to see him for myself first, and I may question him. He will not make a fool of me. None of this shit will affect me. Yes, we must find out where he is. <laughs> So, Dagger, you have seen this man, this master. You've heard him speak. Oh, yes, sir. I have. Only this morning he was here at the town gate of Magdala. You come closer to him, David? Yes, sir. I told you he would find him soon. Now, Dagger, tell me, what did he do here? 
We talked and we listened. You did not know Ethel, too? No, Ethel. Yes. Yes. We did know Ethel. Describe them to me. There, there is a man of this town, Eliza is his name, and he was a hard man. He trusted in his own selfishness. He has been a friend to no one, and no one has been a friend to him. In fact, he and Magdala, when one wishes to indicate how impossible a thing is, we say, as difficult as it's got in the kindness from Eliza. This will give you an idea. Uh, please, and we have no time to come to the point. Well, this morning, I myself saw Eliza give away money to the poor. I had in my possession a coin which he gave me. Here, I was show it to you. See? Yes, yes, of course. Miracle. This is the name. What? The master's word changed Eliza from a psychic man to one of kindness and understanding. There were no cripples made whole, no dead raised again to living, no deaf man made suddenly to hear. To us, it was a greater miracle than all of those to change Eliza to a good man. Oh, yes. The master's word, the strength, the strength in his eyes. I see. Then by the where did he go? He had finished his teaching, but they would not let him go. They followed him out into the desert. And since they had not returned, although I think he must still be teaching him there. Then surely this time he can't be in there. He fell out of one. Come, David. Here, there's there a point to your trouble. There is no need for you to give your coin, sir. It is no trouble. In fact, it has given a purpose to my living. Oh, come along, David. I said, 
man that you have given all the food to one disciple, and yet now he gives as much to a second. And now to a friend, it will be more. He has taken his own to be his first time to kill another disciple, another. Now, my father, I never think that you're the other. Now, the world will not fall over to eat. Now, the world will not fall over to eat. But it's impossible to not do it. So we will ask you to leave it. Well, sir, we have talked to the sister of the people below. Yes, now I see you think. I can only say that you have bewitched me as you have all the others. I think we are even closer to him. I'm a study him. The purpose is just to know all about him. Don't accept him. The power he has, the very thing you've seen him do. Surely this makes him more dangerous than I suspected before. We will draw closer to him. Well, David. David, he was looking at us. It was a perfect step down. No, someone must have told him. How could they know him? But he was looking straight at me. He was going to speak to me. A good food bringeth not forth corrupt food. Neither doth a corrupt food bring forth good food. For every food is known by his own food. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For his words were meant to you. Yes. Yes, I know. And are they not true? How are we to judge him or anyone except by what he does and what he says? But I've been sent to find fault with him, to find evidence against him. Should you not judge by what you've seen and heard? Or what have you seen and heard, sir? And a mother who healed a woman took many years and taught her to do unto others as she would have them do unto her. When our Bella has restored healing and speech to one who was deaf and mute from birth, and taught him to love his neighbor as himself. In Magdala, he turns the man from one who was miserly and hopeful, to one who was charitable and loving. And here we have seen him see the one in there. You're right, David. I can find no faith in him. His words are good. His deeds are good. Now what's the good judgment? And when you return to Carthus, sir? I shall not return to him, Dave. Mm-hmm. I shall remain here and learn the master's way. There's not so much the power of his narrative which is impressed me as the purpose doctrine. This is truly a way of love and kindness. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Next week on this same network at this time, we will present The Pure in Heart, a drama inspired by the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Another episode in The Greatest Story Ever Told from the Greatest Life Ever Lived.
This is Pastor Alva Pendarva speaking, inviting you to stay tuned to hear God's message by our late pastor, L.R. Shelton Sr., on the subject, If I believed as you do, I would lose all my zeal for missions. And this is number 164 in this series. This is one evil that you cannot rightly lay at the door of true Calvinism. I've had many to say to me, Brother Sheldon, if I believed as you do, I would lose all my zeal for Christ, or I would no longer have any zeal for missions or for soul winning. If I believed as you do, I would quit praying. If I believed as you do, I would quit preaching. And I would quit this and I'd quit that. Because if God has ordained men to be saved, as you're preaching, they're going to be saved. And what is the need to do anything about it? Now, I've had many letters (coughs) written to me along that line. Let me ask you a question. Have I... Why have I not lost all my zeal to win men to Christ or for carrying the gospel to the lost far and near? Why do I give everything that comes into my hands? Why do I face persecution and trials and heartaches and financial embarrassments and financial problems? To bring the message to your heart. Why didn't old John Knox lose his zeal? He was a Calvinist to the core. And brother, the world knew that John Knox lived. Why didn't Augustine lose his zeal for souls of men? He was a Calvinist. Why didn't Augustine lose his zeal? Let me ask you another question. Why didn't old Walburton lose his zeal? Why didn't all those old Puritan divines lose their zeal for missions? Why was the 18th century one of the greatest centuries for soul winning since the Apostle Paul? It is because it was packed full of true Calvinists. Why didn't Spurgeon lose his zeal to win men to Christ when never a greater Calvinist lived than Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who for 43 years rocked the city of London and carried the gospel to the world? I answer me that question. Huh? Yet, in our seminaries, in our Bible schools, they'll it honor men like Spurgeon, and yet they will kill men today who preach like Spurgeon. Why didn't the Apostle Paul lose his zeal? Never a greater Calvinist lived than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul didn't have one speck of Arminianism in his teaching. Not one. Yet you'll stand up and say, if I believe like you, Brother Sheldon, I would lose all my zeal to win men for Christ. I'll answer you in these words. Hold your seat now. Listen. Listen. If believing God's Word would make you lose your zeal, then you ought to lose that type of zeal. It's not worth having. The quicker you lose it, the better off you'll be, and the better off the world will be. Yes, the sooner you lose all your fleshly emotionalism and sentimentality and your interreligious profession, the better off you and the whole world will be. And you will stop damning the souls of men. 
You stop trafficking in the souls of men. It'd be the best thing in the world for you to lose what you have. Now, you face that question. All right, you're listening? Calvinism, or believing God's Word, will make you zealous in the Holy Ghost for the souls of men because you have a foundation to stand on. You have a living hope to rest on. You have the assurance that God will save souls, that he will call out his elect and bring them to Christ for salvation. The trouble with us today is that we are not willing to believe and preach and teach the Word of God as it is to deprave men as they are and wait upon the Holy Spirit to do His work in the hearts of men in bringing them to Christ. Now, there's our trouble. we just not willing to wait. Well, are you having any converts? Well, I don't know. A woman wrote me the other day and said, God saved her. Praise God if he has. A woman told me the other day and said, you know, God saved me. I said, praise God if he has. An old missionary spent 50 years in India. Coming back home on a ship. Coming back to die. Someone asked him, how many converts did you have? Well, he said, I don't know. As far as I know, one man was saved. Just one in 50 years of labor? Well, he said, it was worth it if it had been my son. As I stood by the casket of a young man who was instrument, was an instrument in God's hand in bringing me to Christ. I made this statement, that if only one individual had been won to Christ through the preaching of Brother Joe Grenier, and if that one soul was mine, his life was not lived in vain. And I said, that one soul was mine. And when I reached the pearly gate Sunday, and if there's such a thing as rewards, I want to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, give them to Brother Joe Gagne. That boy stood in the breach for my soul. You hear me? And an armed judge and preached and suffered and waited seven years for God to save the first sinner in India. The mission board back home, which was paying his salary, grew so impatient, they threatened to cut his salary off. Folks wanted to call him back home. And finally they wrote him one day and said, Mr. Judson, what are the prospects out there on the mission field? He wrote them back in these words, as bright as the promises of God. It was a gracious and glorious day when Mr. Judson sat down at the Lord's table and ate the Lord's supper with the first born-again believer out there in India under his preaching. And Adam Arm Judson was a Calvinist to the core. Yes, he was. Let me tell you something, friends. The salvation of a soul rest in the hands of a sovereign God. And I'm glad it does. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to take it out and try to add my two cents to it to get one ounce of praise or anything in the world. God never said for me to count results. He said for me to preach the word and be found faithful and leave the results with him. Let me tell you something. I was talking to the French missionary one day, some few years ago, and he said, Brother Shelton, the French mission board has ruined the mission work among the French people where I preach and other missionaries by demanding results. 
We have to work, he said, under such pressure and report results or resign and get out. He said the mission board has made most of us liars because we've had to pad our reports and so to make a showing. He said we've got to have additions to the churches. We've got to report so many converts to hold our jobs, whether they are saved or whether they are not saved. We can't stand here and preach and wait on God to save sinners. We have to have results to raise money for this work. My friend, isn't that an awful day in which we have drifted it is? There's your Arminianism that has wrecked everything in the world spiritually that it has touched from that angle. And as a result, you have your empty religious profession today. Religion without Christ. Profession without possession. Dead converts without life. Now, there you are, and there's a situation we face. Let me say again, all major mission movements since the day of the Apostle Paul have been led by men who embraced Calvinism. Oh, I know that we seemingly have great uh, revival mass movements today, uh, but I'll stake my reputation and everything that I have on this one statement. They are not being brought to Christ. They are not. It's a revival trying to make the world religious without Christ. Now you hold that. But that'll hold water. It won't leak a drop. I'll stake my destiny upon it. And this is the saddest day we have faced in, in that instance. It is... We have gone to seed on Arminianism, free willism, believingism, and decisionism has taken the day, which has led to institutionalism and outward showism. This has led to modernism, a denial of the verbal inspiration of the scriptures, a denial of the virgin birth of Christ and the deity of the Son of God. Now, that's what we're facing. Practically every place of authority in the religious world today is held by a modernist or someone who leans toward modernism. Now, that's so in practically all your denominations. Every place of authority, the vast majority of them, are held by modernists or those who leans toward modernism. That's grown out of your Arminianism and showism today. I'll stake my destiny on it. Modernists captured our seminaries years ago, and through the seminaries have captured our pulpits, and the modernists have translated and captured our Bible. Now, you get that? They have invaded the scriptures and gave us not a translation, but a modernistic interpretation of the Word of God. They call it a Bible, the revised version. Now, they have captured our publishing houses and invaded our Bible, as I said, by putting out the RSV Bible until today, the average church member has no conviction of what he believes. And the average preacher draws his breath, draws his salary, while he lets his congregation go to hell. Now, brother, that's the full fruitage of Arminianism. I know, on the other hand, the full fruitage of Calvinism without Christ is hyper-Calvinism, Called deadism, where no soul ever gets saved. One leads to fatalism, the other leads to despair. Now, brother, I'm not exaggerating the picture at all. It's a sad picture. Christ gave us a prophetic picture 
of our day in the parable of the mustard seed, as recorded in Matthew 13, 31, 32. Let's read it. Listen to God's Word, will you? Matthew 13, 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air came and lodged in the branches thereof. The grain of mustard seed here represents the gospel in purity and power in the early churches. But it became a monstrosity when it grew into a tree, which typifies the large religious bodies today, controlled by the religious hierarchy. The birds here may typify every false doctrine that is lodged within these religious bodies. Now, you, you can't get it out. You can't do anything with it. It's there. They cover it up. They'll fight for one another in there. If you try to expose one of them, brother, they will jump on you from east and west, north and south, and exalt that individual to the skies. That's right. I tried to expose a modernist in our southern seminary. And, brother, they exalted that fellow to the skies and put him in the great positions of authority to cover up his modernism, even though he denied the substitutionary death of Christ, made fun of the virgin birth of the Son of God, and denied the verbal, uh, verbal uh, inspiration of the Scriptures, as well as the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. You just try to tear one of these modernists out of there. Try to shoot one of these birds out of the branches of the trees and see what you get into. There you have present-day religion with all of its bigness, yet with all of its modernism. You get this truth. The Lord God of heaven intended for his children to remain in groups of born-again believers with simplicity of worship, controlled and led by the Holy Spirit, and Christ Lord of all. But the religious world today has gotten away from the simplicity in Christ. Christ stands on the outside of the monstrosity that you call a church today, and the church knows nothing about him because he's on the outside. Why is he out there? Because of the worldliness of the individuals. Instead of salvation, holy of grace, holy of the Lord, being preached by blood redemption in Christ, preached under the power of the Holy Ghost, free willism takes the day, preaches human works for salvation, that is decision for Christ, knowing nothing about Holy Spirit conviction and repentance, nor the inward work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of men. Holy Spirit conviction is an ancient mystery, and repentance is unheard of. They don't know anything about mourning over sin, and when God brings a sinner under conviction, they don't know what to do with him. They want to send him off to the insane asylum. Many individuals in Radio Land who have come under conviction for salvation under this ministry and are mourning over their sins under this preaching have been sent off to the insane asylum because they don't know what to do with them. They hold up a defeated God because they talk as if God's on the sideline looking on helplessly as the world goes to hell. They preach a disappointed Christ because they teach if you don't trust Christ to make a decision for Christ, he'll be disappointed. Let me emphasize again. They put Christ before a sinner for a sinner to decide for or against Christ. Brother, you don't find any such doctrine in God's Word. A sinner stands before a sovereign God to be saved or damned, be accepted are rejected by the Lord God of heaven. Oh, but didn't you say that salvation is free? Yes, sir, it is free. But it is a sovereign free grace. 
in the hands of a sovereign God. God gives as He pleases, and to whom He wills, and when He wills. Now, if you ever get on the Holy Spirit conviction, you'll find that so. Brother, you don't run up and, and jerk salvation out of the hands of God. When you get ready, you stand before the bar of, of justice condemned to die, and you'll sign your death warrant. Then God will have you, then God will save you or damn you as He pleases. Now, you won't have sovereign free grace. You gnash your teeth because that does away with all your little free willism. That does away with all of your decisions and throws you back upon the sovereign, eternal God. I read a book the other day. <coughs> Someone was writing about David Brainerd, the great missionary to the Indians, and talking about his conversion. And David Brainerd, sta David Brainerd states clearly that when he came... When he came to the place, he saw that he was totally depraved, bound by Satan, bound by the cards of sin, and he saw he was at the disposal of a sovereign God. He gnashed his teeth, but he had to come to accept that God was sovereign. God could deliver him or let him stay where he was. He had to accept that decision from a sovereign God and place himself at God's disposal by God's grace. And someone commenting on that said, Well, said the reason David Brainerd said that, that was a squirrel cage in those days, the sovereignty of God. And David Brainerd was caught in that uh, mesh, in that squirrel cage. That shows that the writer knew nothing about Holy Spirit conviction, knew nothing about genuine Bible repentance, did not know one thing in the world, or he'd never written that. Every sinner who ever gets saved comes to the place where he recognizes and knows that God is sovereign, he's bound by Satan, he is totally depraved, he cannot get to Christ, he cannot uh, decide for Christ because his will is depraved. And, brother, there he recognized that grace is free, but in the hands of a sovereign God to be disposed of as God wills. Brother, that's ground to stand on, isn't it? That's solid ground. Brother, you can preach that, and you can wait on God to save sinners, and God will save sinners. Your preaching won't be in vain. No, it wasn't. When old Jeremiah went out preaching... Not many were saved, but there were some. Old Daniel was saved under his preaching. The three Hebrew children were saved under old Jeremiah's preaching. And we don't know how many more, but God's elect was called out. And I praise God that my labors will not be in vain. No, they're not. As these messages go over the known world, are they wakening God's using to wake one here and one there. And they're writing me and saying, Brother Sheldon, praise God that you're true to my soul. And that I, I, I was a religionist for years, but I praise God he's opened my heart and let me see that I was a lost sinner. And that's taking place in all shades and types of religions, among Armenians, Calvinists, so-called, and so on. Brother, they not only represent a disappointed Christ and a defeated God, but they represent a weakling Holy Spirit because they know nothing about Holy Spirit leadership and he's standing helplessly by unable to do one thing about it. That's there. That's their concept. Now, my friends, that's the fruitage of Arminianism. You have it everywhere today. Well, how do you know? I lived in that thing for 25 years and, brother, I ought to know something about it. I lived there for 25 years. What are the results? A worthy church an educated minister without Christ, a substituted gospel, which Paul calls another gospel. They preach another Jesus, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Church membership has been substituted for regeneration. Decision for Christ passed off as salvation. Our Bible has been whittled to pieces. Sin is minimized. Christ is humanized. Man is deified. That sums up the results of Armenianism, which we call free willism. That's a sad picture, isn't it? 
Free willism makes a great show of false professions, counting numbers, glorifying in numbers. Free willism makes a grand display of sentimentalism, joke telling, relying upon the psychology of the mind to bring men to decision for Christ. All this finds no welcome with those who believe the Bible. Bring to the close another broadcast of the Voice of Truth. Again, the title of the message was, If I believed as you do, I would lose all my zeal for mission. This is message number 164 in this series on Calvinism. And you may have a free printed copy simply by requesting it. I want to speak this evening on the most solemn of all gospel subjects. I want to speak upon God's hell. God's hell. Last Lord's Day, we were considering God's heaven, the place that I have not seen, that ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, but God has prepared for those that love him. But this evening, we're going to speak of another place. And it can be said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who reject Him. Now when we come to this subject, we must come in a most solemn and serious manner. Hell is not something to be joked about. Sinful men take the name hell and they band it upon their lips as if it was the subject of some joke, some sordid joke or blasphemy. My friend, hell is a great, solemn, and awful reality. If you lifted your newspaper tomorrow morning, and you read of a house catching fire, and father and mother, and boys and girls, and little baby in the cot, all tragically burned to a cinder, my friend, you wouldn't laugh. You'd close up that newspaper, the lump would come to your throat and the tear to your eye, and you would say, what a tragedy. But friend, I'm going to discourse tonight upon the place where the Christ-rejecting sinner goes. The great conflagration of hell, the place of everlasting flame and eternal torment. And it's not for joking, friend. It's for solemn and serious and awful consideration. This subject needs to be preached because God's people need to be stirred up. Many of God's people today never think about hell. They never consider the hell from which God has saved them. They never consider that their friends and their loved ones and their dear ones and their unconverted families and their unregenerate offspring is headed out for eternal hell and everlasting doom. In fact, hell is seldom in the vocabulary of evangelical preachers today. I went into an evangelical church in a city in Yorkshire and I announced I was preaching on hell. 
And after I had finished, the minister said, I have been here for many years, and I have never preached on hell. And he says, I'll tell you what's more. He says, I've never heard a sermon in hell for about 20 years. And that was a notable evangelical church friend with a notable evangelical minister. I will not mention his name, lest I would bring shame to him. I said to him, shame on you that you have never warned man about hell. God's people need to be stirred up. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, when he was dispatching his first bunch of students from his college, he said, young man, young woman, if I had had my way, I would never have brought you to this college. I would have opened the gates of hell. And for 24 hours... I would have let you walk up and down among the damned and the lost. And then I would have released you and sent you to preach the message free from the wrath to come. The great general said, I would be very certain that your zeal would have never slackened, that your fire would never have gone out. But with earnestness and with a burning unquenchable zeal, you would have warned men of judgment to come. Alas, alas, the gospel pulpit has lost the ram's horn of warning, and men sit unconcerned under the sermons that they hear. We need to preach in hell to stir up the people of God. But friend, I need to bring you this message tonight, dear unconverted friend, in order that you might be warned. In order, my friend, that the red lamp of warning might shed its rays of warning right down into your soul. That you might learn tonight, as you've never learned before, that hell, the Christ rejectors, hell is right before you. May God help you to bestir yourself. May God help you to think tonight and meditate and obey the book. Consider your letter end and be wise. I want to stand under the bell tower. I want to get the rope in my hand. And I want to ring out solemn warning notes to every sinner, lest ye also come into this place of torment. May God alarm you. May God awaken you. May God arrest you. And may God save you from hell tonight. Is my earnest prayer. Now I want to build this message. In answer to three very simple questions. I want to ask the question. Is there a hell? If our answer to that is in the negative. Then the sermon's over. And we needn't consider it anymore. But I can show you tonight from the Scripture and from the authority of heaven that there is a hell. Is there a hell? We're going to answer that tonight. What sort of place is hell? Sinner, you better know the type of place to which you're headed. You better be warned concerning your eternal destiny and your everlasting future. And then I'm going to ask the question, can I escape hell? Do I need to go to hell? Do I need to lose my soul? Do I need to go on in the broad way? Praise God, there's a Savior who can save men from going to hell with everlasting salvation and with mighty eternal grace. Is there a hell? Now, my friend, it doesn't matter what I think personally about this subject. I started to breathe a few years ago, in a few years, in a few months, in a few weeks, perhaps in a few hours, perhaps even in a few minutes, I'll breathe no more. So what man thinks about this subject is absolutely unimportant. Though he may be a scholar, he may be a philosopher, he may be a university professor, he may be a church 
dignitary. He may be a, an ecclesiastical leader, but what he thinks about hell, friend, it doesn't matter that. I know that the churches, in their great confessions and creeds, all talk about this place called hell. But churches have erred. Councils have erred. Theologians have erred. So, my friend, we cannot base our belief in hell on the findings of any man. We cannot base our belief in hell on the great creeds of Christendom. There is only one that can settle this question authoritatively. And that one is the God of heaven himself. Has God spoken? If he has, then let every mouth be dumb and every voice of man be eternally silent. You know, when you walk out of this church tonight, you will see all around you work mansions in the cars that you drive, in the houses that you live in, in the streets of the city, workmanship. You know what workmanship unfairs? It unfairs a workman. There was, there was somebody with brains enough and brawn enough and strength enough to build those cars, to build those houses, to lay those roads. That's simple, isn't it? If I went out and told you everything just came here, you'd say you're a fool. Everything didn't just come. Workmanship! In fairs, a workman. You look into the heavens tonight. I was coming up from Uma. I was looking at this full moon in the sky. What a wonderful thing. And then you think of the little satellites that man boasts about. And look at that gray moon in the sky and the stars. And when I go out there, you know what I see? I see creation. And creation in fairs. A Creator who was strong enough and wise enough and all-powerful enough to make what we see. If I went out and told you that just came there, you'd say, that fellow's a fool. It didn't come there. God put it there. He made the stars also, the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. And friend, I have in my hand a book, and there's no other book like it. This book has been burned. But you come up and take a sniff at it. And there's not the smell of a flame about it. It has stood the flame. It's an unburnable book. It's still with us. This book has been buried in the graves of criticism. It has been discredited. It has been attacked. It has been pan-life. But there's not the mark of a knife upon it. It has withstood the surgeons of higher criticism. It has withstood the scoffs of the atheists. It has withstood all the battering rams of infidelity. And this book still stands, my friend. You know why? This book infers someone wise enough and powerful enough and strong enough to produce it. Man's books perish. They crumble into the dust. Listen, if you're a student of any of the scientists, you know the textbooks written a hundred years ago. They're no good today. Why? Because knowledge supersedes knowledge. And men find out something more. And they find out that the theories of a hundred years ago, they're no good for today. What would you do if your doctor says, I'm practicing medicine on you from a textbook a hundred years old? You'd say, I'll get another doctor. Dear knows what you'll give me. They used to get spiders' legs and uh, frogs' tails for certain diseases in the old days. My friend, you wouldn't go to a surgeon like that, a physician like that. But my friend, here's a book and it has never been outdated. Its truths are eternal. Its word is just as applicable now as it was a hundred, a thousand, two thousand years ago. Still stand. It's the same old book. You know why? Because God penned this book. It's the book of God. So I turn from man's books, and I turn to the book of God. And you know what I find? I find 56 times in the plainest, most unmistakable, most stupendous way, God declares there is a hell. God doesn't say it once. That would be enough. 
God doesn't say it twice. That would be all sufficient. God doesn't say it three times. That would overwhelm us. God says it 56 times. You know what that means? That means, friend, that 56 times God has warned you from heaven that there is a hell. 56 red lumps of scriptural warning across the downward track of every Christless soul in this meeting tonight. What a fool you are that you don't heed the warning lamps of God. What a fool you are that you press on regardless of the consequences of your sin. Yes, my friend, let me tell you this, that if you reject the doctrine of hell, then you've got to reject the doctrine of heaven. I was preaching about heaven Last Sunday, I was talking to a Unitarian some weeks ago, some time ago, and he said to me, I believe in heaven, Mr. Peter. I said, you do? I said, do you believe in hell? Oh, no, he says, our church doesn't believe in hell. I said, why do you believe in heaven? Because, he says, the Bible teaches it. So I said to him, your authority for believing in heaven is the Bible. He says, that's right. Doesn't the Bible talk about heaven? I said, that's right. But I said, the same Bible talks about hell. So I said, if you're going to believe in heaven because the Bible teaches it, you've got to believe in hell because the Bible teaches it. You can't say, I believe in heaven, and then turn around and say, I don't believe in hell. For the authority for believing in heaven is the same authority as believing in hell. Oh, here's the crazy people can become. Let me tell you this, friend. You don't come to me and say, Mr. Paisley, God's a God of love. Because the same Bible that tells me in 28 places that God is a God of love in 61 places tells me that God is a God of wrath. So there's 28 references to God being a God of love. But there's 61 references that God is a God of wrath. Work it out, friend. That's twice as many. References concerning God being a God of wrath and three over. Yeah. So don't you come and say, I'm not believing in hell. I believe God's a God of love. So he is, friend, infinite love. But he's a God of infinite wrath as well. Ah, oh, my friend, let me tell you, if you reject the doctrine of hell, you're rejecting Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ is, there is a hell. Only once did he describe heaven. And he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. The only description, the only insight that he ever gave us into heaven. That is describing it. I know it's inferred in the portion I preached on last Sunday. But by definite, direct description, that's the only portion. But listen, 13 times God, Jesus Christ, describes hell. 13 times. He describes the lake that burned up a fire. He describes where the worm dieth not, and their fire is not quenched. We were reading tonight this solemn declaration of my Lord concerning hell. I don't think I need go any farther this evening. I think I've proved conclusively from the book. I've proved conclusively from the references of the Scripture that there is a hell. Now let me ask a second question. What sort of place is hell? It is a place, first of all, of everlasting pain. You know, there's such a thing as physical pain, and that's a terrible thing. I have been in the hospital wards. I have seen people with excruciating pain, and their bodies were really distorted by the agonies that they were during, enduring. Their whole nerves set an edge, their whole tissues set on fire, and they were baptized in the baptism of pain. Terrible thing, physical pain. But I have gone into homes during the past 22 years. And there was nothing wrong with the people. They were perfectly well physically. But, friend, they had pain worse than physical pain. 
they had mental pain. And mental pain is far worse than physical pain. Mental pain. I stood with a dear father and mother some years ago at their daughter's cot. And their little girl, their only daughter, was dying. And the mother took my hands, and she held my hands as the tears ran down her cheeks. And there was nothing wrong with that dear mother physically, but she was really suffering mental pain. And there's nothing you can do for that but the grace of God. It's a terrible thing, mental pain. I've gone into homes where a boy has gone astray. I've gone into homes where a daughter has gone out and disgraced the family name. And the parents sat by the fireside and they wept their tears in the silence and they had mental pain. That's a terrible thing. But my friend, hell is physical pain. That's bad. Every man in hell will have a body to endure the agonies of eternal damnation. But hell will have mental pain. Man will remember in hell. And their memories will be set on fire with a scourge of everlasting woe and eternal perdition. But let me tell you, friend, that men are going to have eternal pain. Eternal pain. When I was a boy, many a time with my brother, I would go to the edge of a precipice and I would take a little pebble. We all used to do it and we'd throw it over and then we would listen. And when that pebble got away down to the bottom, you know, it sent up a strange sound right up that precipice. And you know, friend, I could take the little pebbles of our English descriptions of pain, agony, anguish, torment, wretchedness, pangs, and I could take them to the edge of hell and I could throw them over to but, friend, they don't bring any echo from the darkness of eternal doom. These words, friend, don't describe at all the terrible doom of sinners. It's a place of everlasting pain. Get that to mind. Lest ye also come into this place of torment. That's the burden of of the rich man in hell. Let me tell you something else. It's a place of vile companionship. Now there are respectable people in this meeting. And you have never raked in the kennels of hell. You have never gone down into the depths of shame. You have never stained your soul with the dark debaucheries of lust and passion and folly. You walk the clean side of the broad road. But let me tell you that hell is a place of vile companionship. When you wake up in hell, you'll be in the company of the off-scourings of the earth. Every refuge of earth is swept by the besom of God's wrath into the darkness of this place called hell. Hell is a place where the scum of the universe comes together. How will you do, my fine, respectable church member, in that blaspheming company down in the pit? Just have a think about it. How will you do in that place that all the harlots and the whoremongers and the drunkards and the adulterers will be present? You know, there's a terrible statement in the book of the Revelation. Every time I read that statement, my friend, I tremble. And it tells us about the people that will be in hell. 21st chapter of Revelation, and it's the verse 8. But the fearful! That's the man in the meetings afraid of getting sick. Oh, there's men here afraid of getting sick. They're scared of their companions. They're scared of their family, some of them. Some of them are scared of the neighbors. Some of them are scared of their large members. They're afraid of getting saved. 
What will my neighbors think? Friend, if you're afraid, you're headed for hell. The Bible says, but the fearful. And then it goes on. It says the unbelieving. And believing and receiving are the same thing in the gospel, you know. But as many as received him to them, give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. That means receiving and believing are the same thing. The people that didn't receive Christ, you're one of them, aren't you? You have never received Christ. How many gospel meetings have you sat in? Hundreds. How many times has the Spirit of God worked upon you? Hundreds of times. And tonight you're still a voice rejecter. You'll be in hell. But the Bible says, the fearful, the unbelieving, Look at this catalog, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and the liars shall all have their part in the lake of fire. It's a place of vile companionships. It is the place of tormenting memory. Oh, you'll have a memory in hell, friend. You'll remember this meeting. You'll remember every gesture the preacher made. You'll remember every word that he spoke and every plea that came from his lips. You'll remember it all. You'll remember the people that prayed for you. You'll remember the solemnness of the hour when you rejected Christ. Hell is a place of tormenting memory. Son, remember. You'll remember in heaven. And you'll remember that you sold heaven for nothing. Some of you are selling heaven for a cigarette. Some of you are selling God's salvation for a glass of booze. Some of you are selling heaven for the dance. Some of you are selling your hopes for eternity from some, for, for some lust of the flesh or some companionship that's ungodly. What a fool you are. But you'll remember it all in hell. Hell is a place of tormenting memory. And hell is a place of unsatisfied desires. You're on probation for eternity. And let me tell you, on the judgment day, you'll rise with every appetite that you've developed down here on earth. There'll be drunkards in hell, but there'll be no drinking. Unsatisfied desires. Gambling! In hell! Gamblers in hell! But no gambling! The gambler will rise with the same fever in his soul. But there will be no gambling in the pit. Evil man will rise with the very same desires that they developed in earth. But hell is a place of unsatisfied desire. Sin is finished as far as satisfying the desires of the body is concerned. It's a terrible place for you. It's no wonder that God's people are alarmed and concerned about you. It's no wonder your godly mother wept for you, son. It's no wonder that your godly father, son, daughter, laid hold on God in the midnight hour to see you saved. For that's where you're headed for. The book is right. Jesus is true. It's the God that cannot lie as I heard this thing. You know, the Bible uses terrible language concerning hell. The Bible says it's a lake of fire. The Bible says hell is a bottomless pit. The Bible says it's a horrible tempest. The Bible says it's a place of sorrow. The Bible says where they will. A place of weeping, a furnace, a place of filthiness, where they curse God, everlasting destruction, a place of outer darkness, where they have no rest, where they never repent, everlasting punishment, where they gnaw their tongues, the blackness of darkness forever, prepared for the devil and his angels, where they cry for a drop of water. Their breath is a living flame. 
They are tormented with fire and brimstone. There are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, unbelievers, where the worm dieth not. Hell fire, sins of darkness, the second death, and wrath to come. Those are just a few extracts from the Bible describing this place called hell. I could go down the English alphabet tonight, and I could take adjective after adjective for every letter in that alphabet to describe hell. Hell is a place of anger. It's a place of anguish. It's a place of the Antichrist. It's the place of awfulness. It's the place of abomination. It's the place of a curse. It's a place of abuse. Hell is a place of burning. A place of blasting, a place of banishment, a place of blackness, a place of bitterness, and a place of blasphemy. Hell is a place of condemnation, continual torment, consuming fire, confessions, cries, catastrophe, chains, criminals, and calamity. Hell is a place of distance, a place of deceit. It is a place of death, of despair, of desire, of disillusionment. Hell is a place of damnation. And I could go on, friend, and I could get adjectives for every letter of the book of the alphabet. Hell is a terrible place. If I had to shut the book now and go home, I would be a preacher of doom. But praise God, there's a way of escape. Praise God, there's not a man or woman, boy or girl in this meeting needs to go to hell. It wasn't prepared for you. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Remember that. And God doesn't put man in hell. Sin puts man in hell. The Westminster Confession of Faith states the biblical doctrine when it says that men go to hell because of their sin. If you awaken hell, it will not be because of God, but because of your sins. The Lord Jesus Christ, by some called Lord, by some called Jesus, and by some called Christ, but by us tonight gladly acknowledged as the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man and the Son of God, not only He told us that there was a hell, but He endured the flames of hell for you and me. At Calvary, He went down the dark rung of the ladders that led to the blackness of the pit. He stepped off the bottom rung of that ladder and he went through the flames of God's infinite wrath. He bore all the curse and all the torments and everything that hell has for me. No wonder he cried, I thirst, because in hell there's thirst. No wonder he said, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? For souls are God forsaken in hell. He endured it all. And he came forth from the darkness and from the bleeding and from the tempest. But he came forth crying, Save them from going down to the pit, for I have found the ransom. And the ransom is his own most precious, precious blood. And man and woman, tonight you can be seen. Praise God for that. If you just come and kneel tonight at the cross and ask God to have mercy upon your sinful soul, and he will save you from hell forevermore. God grant you'll never come to this place of torment. Let's bow our heads.
transcribe story of the patron saint of those in despair, St. Jude. Jude Thaddeus, a man we encountered only by chance. A life that touched ours only for a brief few moments. But for you who despair, listen. I remember how twilight had softened the sounds and shadows of the city of Edessa. I remember the early evening fires of the caravans lighting the hills above the river Euphrates. I remember the portico of the palace where I still worked on the portrait of Altyrian. To the world, Altyrian was ruler of Edessa. To me, he was the foster father who had educated me, guided me, encouraged my talent for art. And I lingered over his portrait, intent upon a flawless work. Then it began, so simply and yet so swiftly. Basil, I want to see the portrait now. But the light is poor here. Hold the lamp over there. But Altieri, in this light, I is... need the lamp. Watch out the flame. I see it. The flame burned your hand. My hand? It's turning red. My hand, it's red. But you must have felt... What did you feel? Nothing. But the skin is raw. I feel nothing now, nothing at all. Basil, why do you look at me so? Sit down here. Why do you look at my face? No reason. There must be a reason. I I, I thought I saw a shadow across your left cheek. Why are you holding the sleeves of your robe closed? Am I? Altirian, why don't you want me to see your arms? Stop questioning me. Are they, are they white splotches? Sores on your arm? I don't know what you mean. I, I think you do. Hold back your sleep. Very well. Oh, no. Oh. I've concealed my arms for weeks. I was so sure the sores would get better and disappear. Instead, they got worse. They look so unclean. Basil, why do you move away from me? Forgive me. You don't think... You surely don't think... I... I can't think... I can't think at all. You're looking at me as if I were loathsome. No, I... I... Yes, you look at me as if I were... I can't say it. It's impossible. I'm not a pauper from the dirty streets. I'm a king. Algerian. It can't happen. Yes, Algerian, it, it has happened. The king of Odessa, the king. A leper. Why do you draw farther away from me? Forgive me. How can I blame you? You think I haven't seen people run from those creatures in the hills? Think I don't remember the tragic sound of their bell? One day, Nerissa and I... Nerissa. My own wife. Basil, I'll never see her again. Nerissa loves you more than life itself. The first time in my life, I'm afraid. Oh, but you're strong. You've always had strength. What kind of strength would give a man courage to face a living death? The portrait, I'd completely forgotten it. The things that were important to me only an hour ago. Gold, silver, jewels, power. Even Nerissa. None of them can help me now. The world holds nothing of value for me. Doctor, then put the dagger away. Did you think I would use it? No, I've not even strength to do that. We're both cowards, aren't we, my son? You didn't dare take one step toward me to remove the dagger from my hand. Now, Thierry, now, I promise you, I, I will try to find help for you. Somehow, somewhere, there must be hope. Hope? For one who is beyond human help? Somehow. If you ever find reason for me to hope, return. And return swiftly. Let me go to him. I haven't told you. You told me he's ill. If he's ill, I must go to him. Altirian is my husband. Nerissa, I beg Let you. Let me go into the room. If he's ill, he needs... Nerissa, come back. <gasps> oh, 
Oh. Why didn't you tell me? You wouldn't let me. You say it was dreadful. Why did you let me see him? You insist. I thought he was ill. He is ill. You call that illness? No. It's a curse. That's what it is. A pestilence. But you're not the first woman to see... His face. It was so awful. In all my life, I've never loved any man but Altyrian. He was all that mattered in the world. And now... Now I... I want to get away from here. I want to go at once. Clarissa, we must help him. Help him? Yes, somehow. You don't mean stay here. I I hadn't quite thought... Of course you hadn't thought. That's obvious. But he needs us, Clarissa. Basil, you're inhuman. You want me to run the risk of my face becoming like his? But if he... You ask me to stay here and watch him rot away? It's not the way of the world, is it? What else is there but the world? No. It's time for both of us to protect our own lives. And if he needed us... He doesn't need anyone. He's a living corpse. But he's still my foster father. And your husband. He was my husband. If you're wise, you'll leave here now as I will, as every servant and slave will do when they know. You've your own life to lead. If I could use it to help him... Have you ever heard of help for a leper? No. Have you... Why, yes. What? I, I just remembered a tale. What tale? Oh, it was nothing. Gossip from a slave, a serving maid I had. Reba, she was a Jewess from a place called Galilee. I know Galilee. It's close to Samaria in Judea, Roman provinces. She entertained me with stories of a Galilean... A man called Jesus. He cured blindness and raised people from the dead. And made lepers clean? It was fiction, pure fiction. She undoubtedly had a very vivid imagination. She even had delusions about it being some sort of God. She called him a messiah. Messiah? I, too, once had a servant who spoke of a messiah. He said, when the Messiah comes, the Jews will take their rightful place in the world. There. Now you see how absurd that is. His name was Jesus. Basil, you you don't really believe. I believe nothing. But I shall go to Galilee. You're a fool. A fantastic, fruitless search after a man who probably doesn't exist. You're just a fool. Wait, Nerissa. How long ago did you hear these tales? All of twelve months. Long enough for an earthquake to have devoured Galilee and everyone in it. I shall not see you again. You're acting on a wild dream. Hmm. But if it isn't a dream, if such a man does exist... Basil! Now, period! You... You... You heard? Yes, I heard. Go to the center of the terrace. Lift out the center stone. It's loose. Concealed under it are two priceless pearls. Take them. Go to Galilee. Every man has his price. The swift hoofs of my horse beat upon a trail beyond the river Euphrates. West across windswept mountains into Syria. South to Damascus. South across the river Jordan and into Galilee. But in Galilee, I was sent to Samaria. And in Samaria, I was sent to Judea. Then when I said aloud, Jesus, the Galilean, the answers were troubled and vague. By that time, I had come near Jerusalem to an inn at the foot of a hill in Bethania. The Galilean? The one called Jesus? Oh, yes, yes, I've seen him, heard him, too. Couldn't help hearing him in these parts. Yes, then you Striking help... appearance, you'd pick him out of a crowd anywhere. Odd, too. Only the son of an artisan, at least that's what they say, just a carpenter from someplace up in Galilee. Uh, 
Nazareth, I think it was. Yes. I never did like Galileans myself, but as yes, I But say, you said he was here. Now, he preached here. Oh, and... my, yes. Stood at the side of the road, told fables. Fables with a sort of moral ending to them. Pretty good, some of them. Others, pretty silly. Like uh, loving your enemies and giving up your life for your fellow man. He said that? He, he said a man should give his life? For another? Yeah, pretty silly, isn't it? <laughs> Catch me giving my life for a Samaritan of all people. Look out for yourself, that's what I say. Where could I go to hear him? Hear him? Oh, you can't hear him. Why not? Because he was arrested. That's why not. Arrested? But if he was only talking to people? And doing all sorts of other fantastic things. Curing lepers. And he and... did cleanse the leper. One. My dear man, ten of them. Oh. Ten, mind you. And he was creating popular disorder. That's what Pontius Pilate said. Well, he... <laughs> and don't try to disagree with the Roman governor. And he's in prison. Prison? Why, he was condemned to death for blasphemy. He was crucified. Dead? Dead as the two thieves on either side of him. Oh. Come a long way. I came just to see him. Uh... Must be very important to you. Very. Traveled many months, eh? From beyond the river Euphrates. Hmm. An Easterner. Always heard Easterners have lots of money. Well, it's too late. I, um, I could do a great deal with a few gold pieces. What do you mean? I mean what I said. A few gold pieces might be useful. Now, I always say a man who wants something bad enough will pay a good price for it. Yes, here. Here, take them. Take them all. <laughs> That's better. Much better. Come outside here. Yes. Closed doors tell no tales. There. Now, look down the road. Huh? You see the tall man under the tree? That's a man from Galilee, Jude Thaddeus. And he's a follower of this Jesus. And I could ask, ask him. Ask nothing. Do as I say if you're wise. Now, that short fellow over there at the well, huh? that's Jude's brother, James. When he finishes getting his drink at the well, they'll join up. And wherever they go, you join them. Where they go... You'll find their master. But you said he was dead. Some say he's been seen alive. That's incredible. My dear man, everything the Galilean did and said was incredible. Now, there. There come the other followers. I'll wager they're having some sort of gathering up there. I'll go after them. But take my advice. Keep out of sight. Hug the bushes at the roadside. That's, uh... Mighty heavy bag you've got over your shoulder. Oh, I'm an artist. I keep my drawing tablet and my materials there. Mm -hmm. Won't be likely you'll draw anything up there. Just a hill. Well, I'll take it along. And mind, don't let them see you. Yes. I'm very grateful to you. <laughs> ah, some folks believe anything. Anything at all. Followed the men, ten of them now, perhaps eleven or twelve. At the summit they stopped. Then one stood above the others on a rock. His lips moved, but I could hear no sound. But suddenly a light seemed to shine upon his face. It was he. It must be he. The one called Jesus. His face was radiant with joy and love and compassion. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. If I could draw his face... I reached for my tablet. I bent forward to make my sketch. But just as I began, the entire hill was flooded with a dazzling blaze. And then there was a great crash. The light! Where, where is the light? I can't see!
Rest, my friend. Don't try to move yet. Rest. Where am I? I... What? I can see. And it was only for a moment. For a moment that I was blinded on the hill. That's where I found you. On the hill. Yes. I know you. You're the man called Jude Thaddeus. Where is he? Where is the one you call Jesus? He has ascended to his rightful place. Beside his father in heaven. You mean he's gone? Only from the sight of men. You're speaking in riddles. If he's gone, how shall I find him? Perhaps you've already found him. How do you mean? By your dress. You have come a long way. From Odessa to search for the man called Jesus. Why? I heard that he could cure lepers. My foster father is a leper. And you believed that my master could help him? Yes. I know it now. From the beginning, I'd put my hope in him. And when I saw him there on the hill, then I was sure of it. That is how you found him. Where there is charity and sacrifice and devotion, there will he be in your midst. Well, you still speak in riddles. If you will remain in Judea, I shall teach you the lessons of my master. But if I can't bring him to Edessa... To his followers, the master has given power to teach, to preach, to heal. Then you will come to Edessa. Alkirian will give you wealth, jewels. Here I have pearls with me. I'll give you those. And what would I do with them? Enjoy them as any man would. For how long? A lifetime. And then? Then? That's the end? Oh, no, you are wrong, my friend. That is but the beginning. Tell me, is gold or silver of use now to your king? And then answer this. If he were not cured, what would help him to live through the rest of his days? Something to give him hope. But that... Oh. Yes, I see it now. The man whose face had compassion in its every line, he could never leave the world, never leave someone like Altirian without the promise of something yet to come. You have learned your first lesson, my friend. And you met me when I despaired, and you've already given me hope. If you could do the same for my king... One day I will come to Odessa. When? When I am needed. But I've told you... You have I... told me of a king who values the world and the things of the world before everything else. When he has prepared his heart to receive Jesus, the Son of God, then will I come. I will teach you, and you will teach him. I will teach you how it is good at times to suffer for the Master. Then a man learns to know the world for what it is. Then he begins to value the riches of heaven. He learns to die to the world, that he may live with the Lord for all eternity. I listened, and I learned, and I loved. And then I remembered what Altirian had said. Will you have reason for me to hope, return and return swiftly. And I returned as I'd come, along the dusty roads of Judea and Samaria and Galilee, and across the river Jordan to Syria. And then I made my way north and east across the river Euphrates to the palace of Edessa. The gardens were deserted, untended, grown with weeds. The halls were empty, and the dust was thick in the room. And in the darkest corner of the darkest room, I found him. Who's there? It's I, Basil. Get out. Go away. Altirian, I said I'd find help for you. The Galilean? You found him? Where is he? Well, let me explain. He's he... not here. He never existed. He existed. He lived. I saw him. And was his price so high that even He has terms... no price. Unless it is the price of love. Altirian... 
You said to me once, if the world holds nothing of value for me, what then? The man called Jesus is not of this world. You must be demented. The fact that you stand here close to me shows that you've lost your senses. I'm going to stay here. Are you? Well, perhaps I can change your mind. I'll open the blinds, let in the light. There. Now, are you still going to stay? Once you said, what kind of strength would give a man courage to face living death? I found courage like that. I found strength for both of us. And hope. You talk of hope. There is hope. Say that when you've been here months alone. Despised, scorned, unclean, a leper. Alterian, you've already learned this. That man may fail you. But you have yet to learn... Jesus will never fail you. His love stands ready at your need. From the depths, he will help you mount to the stars. And so through the day and on into the night, and for many days thereafter, I taught him what Jude taught me. Sometimes he listened. Sometimes he turned his back. Sometimes he sat silent and morose. And then one day I heard him say aloud, I have received from thy hand a cross. I will bear it even unto my death. And I looked up where the moon still hung in the splendor of the sky and one star still burned bright. It was the morning star of hope. I knew then Jude would come. But it was I, Nerissa, who heard Jude first when he reached Odessa, and I needed most to listen to his words. I say to you then, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto life everlasting. Love not alone in word or tongue, but in deed. Go now in peace. And do likewise. He was only a shabby man, speaking to a group of shabby people at the side of the road. But I stood there, rooted to the ground, when I heard his words. Love not alone in word or tongue, but in deed. Oh, Altyrian, my husband, if only I had heard those words before. But it's not too late. It's still possible. I can still help him. And so we were together again in the palace when Basil stood before us with Jude. To Altyrian, I have brought the tablet, forgotten on the hill in Bethania. Basil's drawing tablet? You remember, Altyrian? You remember how I told you I tried to sketch the face of Jesus? Look at the tablet, Altyrian. But there's something on it. It's the face of Jesus. Let me see it. I beg you, let me look at it closely. Yes. Let me put my hands on the lines of his face. Speak to him now, Altirian. If you can live again for him, ask him to make you clean. No. I ask only that my faith may never waver. And my life is his to do with as he pleases. Then I ask him that you be cleansed, that you may serve him here and now as king of Edessa. I ask his mercy. Altarian! Look at your hands! They're clean again. My arms are healed. I am well. Where once hung a portrait in a palace, now hangs a cross. Where the people of Edessa once walked in poverty, they walk now in the riches of heaven. And at sunset one day, we stood on a high hill, Nerissa and Altyrian and I, and we saw Jude go south and west to Persia, to preach, to teach, and to heal. We knew somehow we would never see him again, but we knew too 
Where Jude once walked, no man would ever despair. Through him, to the Son of God, all things are possible. St. Lawrence. To the catacombs. Forward, march. Even as the steady drum of marching feet beat on the streets of Rome, a band of Christians meets in the cavernous catacombs. They have been called by their leader, Pope Sixtus, who but a few hours before was told of a new decree placed before the Roman Senate by Emperor Valerian. The aged pontiff sits in his chair, addressing the assembly. And though the Senate vote was in secret, we may be sure that this last decree of Valerian's will be the supreme test of our faith. What can be done? We can die. I've called you here so that you may be prepared. Have no fear. Think rather of immortality than of death. Someone's coming. Stand fast. Well spoken, success. Stand fast. It's the prefect. Galba. Galba. The catacombs are blocked off by my troops. You'll be butchered if you try to escape. What do you want of us, prefect? I have a decree just passed by the Senate on orders of the emperor. Shall I read it? We can assume its content. Nevertheless, I'll read it for the benefit of the dumb sheep huddled here. Now, senators are a wordy lot. I'll spare you the preamble, the whereases and therefores, and get to the heart of the matter, which is death, hereby decreed for bishops, priests, and deacons. If, if we must die, Galba, know that it's God's will, not the emperor's. The result is the same. That would be true if death were the end of life. I'm not here to discuss a paradox, but to arrest you in obedience to the emperor's decree. Sixtus, you are a bishop. I am bishop of Rome, pope of the Catholic Church. The others beside you? My deacons. My friends, permit me to introduce you to your executioner. Prefect Galba, at my right, you see Januarius, Vincent, and Magnus. At my left is Lawrence. May I ask the prefect to be executed with his holiness? Request denied. We will execute you when it suits our purpose. Come, Sixtus, we're wasting time. Farewell, my children. May God be with you. I am ready. Father, where are you going without your son? Take me with you. I don't leave you, my son. You shall follow me. By a more glorious triumph. When will this be? You have three days on earth. Spend them well, my son. Pope Sixtus and several of the deacons were beheaded immediately after their arrest. Lawrence aroused to great excitement by the prediction of Sixtus, began at once to prepare for his coming death and to spend his last hours in a way that would please God. He hastened to the altar and began to gather the sacred vessels. Who's there? Stephen. It's I, Lawrence. Lawrence? What are you doing with the sacred vessels, Stephen? You and I have but a few hours to live. Everything must be turned into money and distributed to the poor. Surely not the chalices for the sacrament. Everything. Nothing must be held out. This would be the way the Holy Father would want it. But even so... You were not there when the Holy Father was arrested. He spoke to me and said I should spend my time well before I joined him. I have heard. Then what better way to live than to give what there is to the poor? But I... Yes, yes. Even to this vessel from which so many have drunk of Christ's blood. It's sacred. It's silver. Precious, because it will feed a starving man. 
Christ quenched his thirst from a vinegar-soaked sponge. What can I do to help? Search for anything that has value and convert it to money. Bring the coins to the Tiber Bridge and we'll distribute them to the poor. I'll have them gathered there. And be careful. The guards are looking for you. Halt! Come here. What have you in that bag? Alms for the poor. You're a Christian? Yes. Are you a deacon? Yes. Your name? Stephen. Come with me. Did this Stephen talk before he was executed? Uh, the same words as always. They welcome death because they believe in the words of a man on a cross. But he said nothing about where he got the money. No. Useless to threaten them with death. They welcome them as if it were a bride. These Christians are scattering money right and left to the beggars. Gaba, you must find where they hide that money. I've searched every corner in Rome. Not all the officials have been executed? All but one. A deacon named Lawrence. Find him and bring him here. Perhaps we can persuade him to tell us where the church has hidden its treasures. Senator, here is Deacon Lawrence. Oh, sit down. No need to be frightened. Thank you. Uh, you Christians often complain we uh, treat you harshly. Now, I've not brought you here for torture. I merely want to inquire about something that uh, concerns you. I shall answer to the best of my ability. Uh, good. Now, I'm told you priests make offerings in golden platters that what you call the sacred blood is served from a silver goblet. And at your night ceremonies, the wax tapers are fixed in golden candlesticks. It's true. We make use of precious metals. But these things are not mandatory to the administration of the sacraments. Bring out these hidden treasures. The emperor needs money for the maintenance of his forces. The church didn't acquire its wealth for conquest, but for the salvation of all mankind. Lawrence, isn't it a doctrine of your belief that you must render to Caesar the things that belong to him? Christ spoke thus when asked if he should render tribute to Caesar. Your God brought no money with him into this world. No. Nor caused it to be coined. What are you driving at, Gaba? You'll see, Senator. Answer the question, Lawrence. No. He came to this world with nothing and left it with a promise. He brought only words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, it's Caesar who has his head on the coins and gives them value. Yes. Yes, Gaba, I see. Lawrence, uh, give us, therefore, the money, and you can be rich in words. The church is indeed rich. Just as I told you, Gamba. The emperor has no treasure equal to it. Show us where it's hidden, Lawrence. Do so, and perhaps we can arrange for you to escape just before your execution. I will show you the church's treasure. But you must allow me a little time to set everything in order and make an inventory. I give you two days. That's all. You may go. I told you, Galba. They're rich. Did you hear him? Valyrian's treasure can't equal theirs. Strange that I've never been able to find a trace of it. That uh, it was very clever of you to uh, trick him with his own uh, doctrine. Thank you, Senator. Very clever, but I um, am a bit puzzled by it. Oh? Yes, that you should be so well-informed regarding Christian religion. Only one well-informed himself could make that observation, Senator. Uh, perhaps it's best we drop the subject. Good day, Galma. As Lawrence left the senator's house, he was exalted in the knowledge that Sextus's prophecy might come true. Every ounce of gold and silver the church owned had been given away and he knew that death would be sure when he returned empty-handed. And yet, he had told the senator and Galba 
the church had great treasure. He must show them this treasure. But how? His thoughts turned to the outcasts of the city. He quickly retraced his steps, crossed the Tiber Bridge, and made his way to a house in the heart of the slums. Yes. Who is it? Lawrence. Come in quickly. I'm surprised to see you. I was told all priests and deacons had been arrested or were executed. I'm the only one left. I need your help. You need only ask. How many poor, blind, sick, lame are there in this section of the city? Oh, hundreds. Not afraid to identify themselves as Christians? Most of them would have been dead if it not been for the church. They'd risk their lives to show their gratitude. Then rally them. And day after tomorrow, march them into the street before Prefect Galba's house. That's all? Yes. At what time of day? When the sun is still three hours high. It shall be done as you wish. section of Rome to another, to the hospitals, the leper colony, the orphanages, to call on people to announce their faith in Christ. He shunned the homes of senators and people of quality, for Valerian's decree provided banishment and forfeiture of property for all those who confessed themselves Christian, and from experience, he knew how strongly men were attached to their property. At the appointed time, on the second day, he was ushered into the room where Galba and the senator were eagerly awaiting him. Ah, come in, Lawrence. Yes, be seated. You've completed your inventory? Yes. How much is the treasure? It's incalculable. Oh, come. There's nothing that can't be measured. Uh, where is it hidden? In the hearts of men. Uh, Lawrence, I gave you two days to show us the treasure. Now stop speaking in riddles or I shall What's be... What's that? Oh, look below. The rabble of beggars. But the blind. Oh, the sick and the lame. I'll have the guards disperse them at once. Would you scatter the treasure I've so carefully gathered? What? What's that? What are you talking about? Don't turn away and hold your nose, Galba. Look upon them. The poor. The humble. The miserable. Yes. Despised by man, but remembered by God's church. They've come to avow their faith. These are the treasures of the church I promised you. This is a trick that'll cost you your life. The axes and ensigns of Roman power are not for insult. No, no, listen to me. These are the riches of the church. These are the ones of whom Christ said, sell what you have and give unto them. Look well upon that crowd. For there lies your salvation. That which you do for the most miserable beggar, you do unto Christ. Take him away, Galba, and behead him at once. Mm. Oh, no, Senator. No, he would welcome that. See, see how his face lights up. He wants to die. That's your madness and your vanity, Lawrence. But we've ways of making death unattractive. It matters not how or when a man dies, but what he dies for. We'll see. The time will come when you'll cry out for us to put an end to your suffering. Then we'll give you back your words. No, Lawrence. You'll not die by one quick stroke, but by slow degrees. Here, you. What's your name? K.S. One of the treasures of the church who led that mob. I was present. I did not leave. Well, don't put those faggots on the fire. We want a bed of coals, not roaring flames. As you wish, my lord. Now give those others a hand to place that bed with the prisoner over the pit. Make sure he's securely tied. Have no fear. Well, Lawrence, the fire's waiting for you. No, Galpa. I am waiting for the fire. Put down the bed.
Lawrence was placed on the gridiron a few inches above the glowing coals. His faithful followers bowed their heads in prayer and asked God to be merciful in his hour of agony. His enemies waited with mocking smiles upon their lips, waiting for his cries of pain. But it was Lawrence who smiled, and it seemed as if he rested as one in ecstasy. To the Christians, it seemed that his face was surrounded by a beautiful light, and his suffering body gave off a sweet odor. But the unbelievers saw and sensed only what they were accustomed to in the presence of torture. Galba, I can't stand much more of this. Why doesn't he give some sign of pain? I can't understand it. It's unnatural. But yet he lies there and destroys us with his silence. Destroys, Senator? What else? When we make this test of his God against ours and his spirit doesn't break. I'm coming to doubt the wisdom of these tortures. We've killed hundreds, but Christianity's stronger than ever. Should I stop this thing? No, no, no. We must not show weakness before the mob. Try to have Lawrence talk. Perhaps he will give some sign that the pain's greater than he pretends. Very well. Lawrence? Can you hear me? Yes, Prefect. Isn't it because you're akin to the devil that you don't feel his fire on your flesh? Rather, it is that my Christ is with me, and the fire of his passion is alive in my breast so intensely that your coals are a comfort and a refreshment. But didn't your Christ call out in pain when he was crucified? <laughs> in your vanity, you're setting yourself above him. Never that. Then... Then why should one greater than yourself acknowledge pain and you deny it? Christ's tormentors spoke more truth than intended when they shouted, He can save others, but not himself. His death was man's salvation. Oh, his words, words, words with you Christians. Words which twist back upon themselves and make contradictions seem profound. Can you Christians never speak words that ordinary man can understand? Yes, Yes, I can. Then do so. Let my body be turned. One side is broiled enough. Lay upon the multitude surrounding the glowing pit. As the hours went by, it intensified until people became conscious even of the sound of their breathing. The silence became oppressive and then terrifying as the persecutors waited for a single cry of agony. From the roasting man on the coals, Galba and the senator looked into each other's eyes, quickly looked away, for each knew that stark terror gripped the heart of the other. From the far edge of the crowd, a woman sobbed, and the sound pierced the awful silence. Men stirred from cramped positions and softly prayed. Galba. I'm afraid. I know the feeling. I've never known a fear like this. Can we be wrong? And the Christians right about their Christ being the Son of God? Wait, wait. Lawrence is stirring. He is going to speak. Executioner. What? What do you want with the executioner? The body is cooked enough. Prepare for the feast. Stop it! Stop it! Stop torturing us, Lawrence. I beg you. I beg you in the name of your God. Give us some sign you're made of the same clay as the rest of us. Give us some hope that we've not destroyed one who's divine. I am nothing, Senator. Only a man about to be returned to the dust. Only a man like the rest of you. Except that I believe in the word. But my time has come. I pray for your conversion. For the conversion of Rome. And that from Rome the faith of Christ shall spread to all parts of the world. Tell me the truth, Lawrence. Are you divine? Lawrence. Do you hear me? Answer, are you divine? He's dead.
God began to grant Lawrence's request for the conversion of Rome from the moment he made it. Several senators were so moved by the heroic fortitude and piety that they proclaimed their faith in Christianity on the spot. And as Caius moved forward to speak to Galba, they followed him. My lord. Yes? Well, what is it you want? May we have the body. What will you do with it? We beg you to permit us to give it honorable burial. Take his body. Do with it as you wish. Quick, help me lift him from the pit. See. See who lifts the body. Not not the rabble. Four of the noblest men of Rome. The end has come for Roman gods. Shall I arrest them, Senator? Oh, what good would it do? We tortured a man to destroy his faith. We killed him, but made converts of those who came to mock and jeer. We are fighting words with fire and rack and swords. We cut out the tongue, but the word lives on in the minds and hearts of those who heard. Galba, the time of decision is here for us, too. Yes. I know. There. There stands the temple of Jupiter. There the procession with Lawrence's body. I, I have an overwhelming feeling. I must pray for help. Let us follow the procession. cemetery near the Via Tiburtina, and his death marked the decline of idolatry in Rome. For the living, St. Lawrence demonstrates the power of grace of Christ, which is able to sweeten whatever is bitter and harsh to flesh and blood. with Fuller Seminary proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. Without further ado, let's join the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, which is about to get underway.
invite us to stand and sing Heavenly Sunshine. You know, we always want you to sing with a smile in your voice. I've reflected out, my, what a wonderful audience here today. Are you ready to sing Heavenly Sunshine? Everybody ready to sing? Put your hand up. Let's see now. All right, as you sing through the first time, turn around and shake hands with everyone. All together. All right, turn around and shake hands. Old-fashioned revival, our quartet will sing Constantly Abiding. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I'm a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers all Savior and King, when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind, I will never
was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It paid my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn him, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right, it makes it right. Sometimes my past seems dreary without a ray of cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mists of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. When you feel in prayer, we'll turn him. And your golden fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. And when you feel a prayer will turn him, and you know the fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Mrs. Fuller, that is, honey, reading the letters. I have some good letters to read to you today, friend. The first one comes from Florida, in which a lady writes, I listen regularly to your program. Last month, when I was vacationing and working in the Black Mountains in North Carolina, we went hiking on Sunday morning. And as we passed up the roads and paths, from many of the mountain cabins, we could hear the Fuller program. It seems that sound carries far in the mountains, and it did sound so sweet. From the United States Naval Hospital, a man writes, Dear Sir, 
I am one of those who knows Christ as my personal Savior. Also, I love the Revival Hour and have been a listener for a long time. I'm now in the Mare Island Navy Hospital with an injured back. Last Sunday morning, I tuned in on your program, and there was quite a bit of noise in the ward for the first few minutes. But it soon quieted down, for most of the fellows were listening. And you could have heard a needle drop before the hour finished. It blessed my soul, and may God prosper your work. Here is an arresting letter from a treatment station for leprosy in Cebu in the Philippine Islands. Dear Reverend Fuller, greetings to you from the Philippines in the name that is above every name. Someone must have told you that there was a little group of believers in this institution, for you sent some literature to help strengthen our faith in God and to help us grow in the knowledge of his word. We thank him for this bond of love that joins his children regardless of race, distance, or social position. We were much cheered by your kindness. We have heard about your blessed and fruitful work in reaching the unsaved through the old-fashioned revival hour, but we had no radio of our own. The Word of God has taught us to let our requests be be made known unto him. We did, and we are thankful he granted the desire of our hearts and sent us a radio. I chanced to tune to Manila, and I heard a religious service. Attentively I listened, and I found it was the very old-fashioned revival hour that I had hoped so earnestly to hear. From that time, we are always listening to your gospel broadcast, and you could not imagine how much your messages and hymns have brought us spiritual comfort. We are glad that you thoughtfully and kindly remember the shut-ins in your hymns and prayers. We are also rejoicing and praising the Lord for the souls that repent and are saved. During that time when hands are being raised, and you reverently say, God bless you, we out here in our affliction are conscious that we are a little part of that great congregation on the air. Finally, in behalf of the patients in this leprosarium, We send our sincere thanks for your program, which blesses us and cheers us. We pray for you. Please pray for us also. And that is all I shall have time for today, friends. Last Sunday, a very thrilling incident took place here in Long Beach, and I want to pass it on to you, the visible audience, and also to the radio audience. A man came here to Long Beach early, or to the beach last Sunday, very early, to commit suicide, home wrecked by drink, on his way to take his life. And when he came here to Long Beach last Sunday, He remembered that the old-fashioned revival hour was broadcast from the municipal auditorium here in the afternoon, and he waited out in front of this auditorium until the doors were opened. And he came in, came forward, and was gloriously saved. And this past week, he was restored to his family, a home saved, a soul saved for eternity. I'm going to ask you to stand now and sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. And as you sing in the Spirit, I want you to pray that those that are in darkness will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit wooing them, and that they too may find Christ. Someone else may be on the threshold of committing suicide, I don't know. Will you just kneel wherever you are, if you're out in a room or in a hospital, and give your heart to the Lord as we sing this invitation number, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. One verse.
for prayer. Our Father, we thank thee that thou art not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we're thankful today that the blood of Jesus Christ, thy Son, cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness, that thou art willing to forgive us of our sins and put them behind thy back, never to remember them against us anymore forever, blotting them out. And we thank thee for the great redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And may the Holy Spirit right now indict the words and bring many to a place of decision, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Is it well with your soul? Listen attentively while the quartet sings, It is well with my soul.
receiving our monthly publication, The Heart to Heart Talks, we will be glad to send them to you upon the receipt of your request. I wonder if you know how much it means to us to hear from you, our radio friends of the audience out in the unseen audience. Your regular letters are a great source of encouragement in carrying on this weekly broadcast of the gospel. It is comforting to know that you are standing by in these perilous times when it is so important that we continue to send out the glad tidings of salvation. Perhaps you have personally received some spiritual blessing from this hour, but yet you have failed to tell us about it. Won't you write us today without fail? You are listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message today is titled, Moses Kept the Passover. I'll provide address information after Dr. Fuller's message. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews as we rejoin the broadcast. You're listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour brought to you by the Gospel Broadcasting Association from the Municipal Auditorium in Long Beach, California. Charles E. Fuller speaking. Just before the message, you'll hear the quartet sing, There is a Fountain. Oh, my 
With your Bibles open, please, to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 28. Let me read, Through faith or by faith Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Moses, who by faith refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, who by faith forsook Egypt, you can read it there in the 27th verse, speaking upon the last of the three acts of faith mentioned in connection with him as follows, the 28th verse, which I have just read within your hearing. May I direct your attention to this, that in reference to the first two acts of faith, that these two acts were all personal, that is, relating specifically to Moses, that is, he refused, he forsook, but in reference to this third act of faith, While there is a personal element, yet there is a great difference. For this third act of faith not only affected Moses, but also affected all the people of Israel. Furthermore, this third act of faith not only affected the people of the nation Israel on that memorable Passover night, but that third act has affected people from all kindred, nations, and towns in the intervening centuries, and will continue to affect all the redeemed in all ages to come. In other words, this third act of faith mentioned in connection with Moses is of a different character than the first two acts of faith. Now, this is all brought out in the little word, kept. And I want to pass it on to you. Moses kept, that is, instituted the Passover and instituted the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should not touch them. In reference to the first two acts, there is nothing left of them but their record, their example, their lessons. But here, in reference to this third act, Something took place which has continued down through the centuries, is powerful today, even at this very moment, is powerful, and will continue to be of great power throughout the eternal ages to come. Let me explain. This word, kept, is a word which, though it speaks of past action, has with it continuing results. Let me repeat, this word kept has or speaks of past action, but also has continuing results. Moses kept, that is, instituted the Passover, past action. Its continuing results are twofold. First, the act of faith has been ever since that memorable night of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, telling of Christ, our Passover, slain for us, delivering all who will accept Christ as their personal Savior, delivering them from the bondage of sin, Satan, and judgment, and the powers of darkness. Remember, Christ, The Lamb of God was foreordained before the foundation of the world, foreordained to shed his precious blood. And he has been manifest in these last times for us. Christ, our Passover, slain for us. Second, this third act of faith, foreshadowing Christ, our Passover, continues on. For First John says that the blood of Christ, God's Son, continually cleanses us from all sin. And so, with the instituting of the Passover, it was not only for that night in Egypt, but continued on to foreshadow the cross of Calvary, and will continue on throughout all the eternal ages. Listen, for Christ, now risen, glorified, bears the marks of Calvary 
in his sight. And when we see the risen, glorified Christ, and we are glorified with him, we shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. May we take our Bibles now and turn back to the 11th chapter of Exodus. I like to give these references and like to have you study with us on this, the old-fashioned revival hour. Turning back to the 11th chapter of Exodus, we learn something of the background of this act of faith, which had such a great result then and still continues to have such a far-reaching result now. The opening chapters of Exodus record the fact that the children of Israel had been in Egypt some 400 years. For several generations they lived in peace. They prospered and were a happy people. But a new king, which knew not Joseph, came upon the throne to rule over that powerful nation. Under the rule of this new king, he proved to be a very cruel, wicked king. He issued proclamation that the children of Israel should become virtual slaves to serve the Egyptians with rigor. In God's time, Moses was raised up, the divinely appointed deliverer. Chapter 3 records that, how God appointed Moses at the burning bush to go into the presence of Pharaoh. And there in that chapter, we find these words. The Lord said, I have heard or I have seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster. For I know their sorrow, foreshadowing Christ our high priest, who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Well... Let's go on. Chapter 5, we see Moses appearing before Pharaoh with a demand, let my people go. Pharaoh is defiant, stubborn, self-willed, disobedient, stiff-necked, just exactly like some of you sinners are. He refuses to allow the children of Israel to go. Then, quickly, one after another, ten judgments, from the hand of God come down upon that powerful, proud nation. Nine judgments in quick succession. A pause, then the tenth. The waters of the Nile, the river which the Egyptians worshipped, was turned into blood. Frogs came up and covered the land. Dust was turned into lice. Grievous swarms of flies covered the lands and filled the dwellings. Grievous sickness came upon the cattle, horses, and camels. Men were afflicted with grievous boils. Hail descended, stripping the fruit trees and beating the grain stalks to the ground. Locusts came upon the land to eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail had left. And then the night's judgment, darkness. Furthermore, after the ninth judgment, Moses was threatened with death from the hands of Pharaoh. Chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. Let me read them to you. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me. Take heed to thyself. See my face no more. For in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. And it came literally to pass. All right. Even though, on the other hand, Moses had promised to deliver them, that is, the children of Israel, from bondage, up to this time, he had not made good the promises. Israel was ready to turn on him as the Pharisees of old turned on Christ and said, Away with him! Crucify him! They tried to do away with him, even to slay him, if possible. On the one hand, death from the hands of Pharaoh. On the other hand, 
rebellion and possible death from the children of Israel. And Moses, God's man, is in a tight place at wit's end corner. Besides this, double darkness over the land of Egypt. And in the midst of such a desperate situation, God speaks. Moses hears. Moses believes God. Moses institutes the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he, that is God, that destroyed the firstborn, should not touch them. And so we come to chapter 11 of Exodus. Verse 1, I love to give you much of God's Word. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence, and when he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. A remarkable chapter. Look at verses 4 to 7. I won't have time to read them all. Just to give you the high spots, fourth verse, about midnight, God says, Will I go into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. Goes on to speak that there'll be a great cry. Read it for yourself. Then follows the institution of the Passover, as recorded in chapter 12, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, which, Lord willing, we'll study in much detail next Lord's Day. But now, listen to chapter 12, just two verses, with that background of double darkness, threatened by death from the hands of Pharaoh, threatened by rebellion and possible death from the hands of the Israelites, and in a desperate situation, God speaks, Moses hears, Moses believes, and institutes the Passover. And the gist of it is this, in chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, here it is. Will you listen carefully and prayerfully? For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you, when I smite the land of Egypt. Why should this last judgment, the death of the firstborn, be expected to accomplish what the nine had failed to do? The children of Israel were standing there ready to go. Would the mere sprinkling of blood have such a remarkable effect? And furthermore, if the people of Israel were indeed to leave Egypt that same night, why should they be burdened with all the minute ceremonial observance at the very moment when they ought to be making preparation for their departure? For he had told them, Ye shall eat the Passover with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Moses, in such an hour, hears from God what he was about to do. And to the human mind, to human reasoning, to the sense and to the sight, it must have seemed so foolish, so inadequate, and quite unlikely even ridiculous, to accomplish anything. And that's exactly what people are saying today about the shed blood of Christ. Away with it. I do not want the blood of Jesus. Don't believe in it. Sorry for it. But listen, 
Why should they, the Israelites, taking a little lamb without spot or blemish, slay that lamb and strike the blood on the two side posts and on the upper door posts? Why should it accomplish anything? But God said, and that settles it with me, the blood, the shed blood of the lamb shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the judgment shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land. And, beloved, the judgments of God is recorded in Revelation, a repetition of the judgments of Egypt centuries ago, is about to fall upon the land and the nation and the people. And only those that are under the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, will be safe in the day of judgment. And I'm making it just as plain as I know how. Ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And the sixth chapter of Revelation records the words of those in the days to come, what they will do when God comes in Christ, bringing judgment and wrath upon an ungodly world. Listen, and the kings of earth and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, every freeman, will try to hide themselves from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and hide in the dens and in the rocks, and say, The Lamb, listen, the great day of the wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? And I say to you on the authority of God's Word, if it's the last sermon I ever preach, that the only place of salvation, security, is under the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? Will you trample underfoot the precious blood and do despite to the Spirit of grace and go out into eternity a lost soul? God forbid. Friend, in Radio Land, God has been speaking to you under conviction. Will you kneel by faith at the foot of the cross and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. God bless you. I'm not going to take too much time to urge you. It's between you and God. What will you do with this man called Jesus? While our heads are bowed in this visible audience, Christians pray. As we bring the old-fashioned revival hour to a close, how many will quickly put their hand up and say, Brother Fuller, pray for me. I want Christ as my personal Savior. I'd like to be remembered. God bless you. I'd like to be remembered in a word of prayer. Put your hand up. God bless you. Anyone else? Quickly, just before we... God bless you. Leave the old... God bless you, lady. Anyone else on the lower floor here? Put your hand up and say, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. In the balconies to my left, anyone there, put your hand up and say, pray for me. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Continue in prayer as we leave the air. We'll have a short altar service at the close.
to the memory of this last survivor of the 8,000 Jews who fought under the banner of the Union in the Civil War, we dedicate this program. The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations bring you Chapter 19 of The Eternal Light. This public service program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our story today, entitled Mr. Lincoln and the Rabbi, is written by Morton Wishengrad and features Roger DeCoven as Benjamin Zold. Following the dramatic portion of the program, you will hear a talk by Dr. Bernard J. Bamberger. Avadim hayinu hayinu Ata benechorim benechorim Spring had come early. April was a seed time of hope and a promise of fertility. In the spring of 1861, few men could foresee the terrible harvest of the year's end. Benjamin Soule was my name, and I was the rabbi of the congregation Ohev Shalom in the city of Baltimore. 1861. I should tell you a story of that year, a story of a man called Simeon Marks and another man called Abraham Lincoln. And if what I have to tell holds more in the telling of legend than of history... I pray you to consider the words of a sage of Israel that while history has her truth, legend has her truth also. <laughs> There was peace in the little study of my house on Utah Street. The Sabbath sermon was nearly finished, and I was content. Content, that is, until two members of the congregation paid me an unexpected visit. Rabbi Zold, we don't want you to deliver that sermon. That's curious, Simeon. How do you know what's in it? We can guess. Jacob's right. Rabbi Zold, we don't like slavery any more than you do. But we're Southerners, and we won't see the South attack. Tear it up, Rabbi Zold. Stop preaching against the law of Maryland. It's no crime to own a slave in this state, and you know it. Yes, I know. What is called law we've made into an assassin? We're not asking you to defend slavery, but we are asking you not to condemn it. Your sermons have split the congregation down the middle. It's got to end, Rabbi Zold. And if it doesn't, well, you yourself will have no choice but to leave. Drink your tea, Benjamin, before it gets cold. That's all right, Sophie. I, I just want to think. There are other congregations. There's a place waiting for you in New England. Sophie, I'm a rabbi. If I have a function, it's to mediate between men to settle differences. I don't want my sermons to be a bleeding sore. Your tea is getting cold. Oh, now stop worrying. Besides, Mr. Ephraim is going to be here soon to talk about that pulpit in Boston. I know. What are you going to tell Mr. Ephraim? I don't know, Sophie. I just don't know. Nice country, this, Rabbi Zoll. Warmer than Boston. Uh, I like Boston. Couldn't get me to stay here for all the money in the world. No, Mr. Ephraim? No. Rabbi, slavery is a curse against humanity. Mr. Ephraim, what brought you south? Offer you a new pulpit, Rabbi. What else? 
Well, I have to buy some cotton. The mill's running low. You don't make textiles without cotton. Slave cotton, Mr. Ethan. We can't help ourselves, Rabbi Zold. That's a mighty unfriendly thing to say. Oh. Mr. Ephraim. Thanks for driving me to the station, Rabbi. Try to understand me, sir. I hate slavery, but I don't blame the South for it. I live in the South. I see men like other men, no better, no worse. The North can rail as much as it chooses, but the North bears equal responsibility with the South. Southern slave cotton makes Yankee mills turn. Mm. I suppose that little speech means you've turned us down. Yes, Mr. Ephraim. Well, suit yourself, Rabbi. Tell me, uh, if the war comes, where will you stand? With the North or with the South? That's a hard question, Mr. Reefen. I'll give you a hard answer. Hard for me, at any rate. I'll stand with the North. <laughs> uh, my head spins. Isn't anybody clear about anything? There was a French philosopher named Pascal, Mr. Reefen. He said once the truth is two opposites. That's about the only thing that is clear. I'm going to stick to my congregation, Mr. Ethan. That's all I can do. Simeon asked me not to deliver was in my hand. The service was over. The congregation was tense. For I had announced a sermon and a discussion to follow. Sophie sat in the first pew watching my face. Simeon watched also. And there was a plea in his eyes. A plea which I had to disregard. <laughs> for my text, a verse from Isaiah. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Members of the congregation, I'm reluctant to be a cause of dissension in your midst. Yet it seems to me that not I, but the word that we live by is that cause. That word, this book, cannot be warrant or authority against humanity itself. Evil cannot be ratified by law. Custom cannot make sin a tradition. There are some, I know, who open the Bible to find sanction for slavery. They falsify the word of God. Will you let the forger find sanction in the Bible for forgery or the adulterer find sanction for adultery? Simeon Marks, you came to me in French and gave me friendly counsel. Forgive me for addressing you this way, but Simeon, how shall I answer evil if not with justice? If slavery is a right, humanity is a fraud. And if I remain silent, am I not a hypocrite? May I speak, Rabbi? Please do, Simeon. There's a colored man in my house called Jim. I've taught him to read. I've clothed him. I've tended him when he is sick. Am I evil because of that? You are a master who is kind to a slave. There is evil in that, Simeon. But I'm not responsible for the system. I did not make the law or the decisions of the Supreme Court. Rabbi, you know in your heart and soul that there is more understanding and consideration for the Negro here than there is in the North. It's an easy thing for the master to be benevolent, Simeon. Look in Mishnah Sanhedrin. Only one man was created by God as the common ancestor of all men for the sake of the peace of the human race, that one may not say to another, my ancestor was better than thine. Have I said that I am better than Jim? Your actions say it. 
your benevolent sentence. Isn't it better for Jim to stay with me and be treated well? He deserves your good treatment as a man, not as your slave. What if I freed Jim? One man, one among millions. Is it right to ask me to do what no one else does? I remind you that you are a Hebrew, a descendant of those Israelites who were the first to proclaim liberty. I remind you, Simeon, and I remind this congregation what Israel has always represented. I recall to you that it was the ancient sect of the Essenes which first declared slavery to be a crime. I'm not wrong when I remind you of these things. What is it you want from me, a platitude? Cantor, I... I think it's time for Yigdal. Yigdal Elohim Chai Me'yishabach Nimtso B'yayinai Sel Metsiyuso sang the words of the concluding Sabbath hymn, words of love and kindness and mercy for men created in the image of God. And as we listened, I thought of the besetting sin of our generation, to open the book, to scan the text, and to seek confirmation only for what has already been done or for what is desired. I was only a rabbi. I was no bookkeeper of consciences. Yet Simeon was on my conscience. He troubled me. He troubled me a great deal in the days that followed. And not only Simeon, but the man Jim, Simeon's slave. And then one night, there was a knock on the door of the house in Utah Street. I'll see who it is. something wrong with Simeon? Please, ma'am. You've got to let me in. Quick. Jim, what's happened? Please, ma'am. Please, please close the door. Of course. Reverend. Reverend, you mustn't let him take me. I come to you because I was here to speak of you. You can't let him find me. I'll kill myself first, Reverend. Jim, you run away, haven't you? I won't be taken. No one's going to send me back. No one will, Jim. Swear it. On the book. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Reverend. But I'm scared. Terrible scared. Uh, I'm sorry. Sit down, Jim. That's better, isn't it? Now, why did you run away, Jim? Were you mistreated? No, never. Then why did you run away? No people were slaves once. You run away. Here, Jim. I brought you this. Now, drink it hot. Well, thank you. Kindly, man. It's all right, Jim. Why is... Why is everybody good to me? I don't want no one to be good to me. I don't want to be treated special. I can't stand it no more. I can't. I don't know where to turn. don't know what to do, where to go. Ain't no place for me to go. No place. No where. Jim. Jim, please. If you say to the white man, Mister, you forget your hat, he said, black man, go get it for me. Jim. Jim, do you take sugar? Sugar? Yes, ma'am. Two lumps, please. I think it's... It's time to... Excuse me, it's time to feed the baby. You can stay here, Jim. You won't give me up, Reverend. I don't want to keep saying it, but don't give me up. Trust me, Jim. Well, how can I? you got to give me up. That's the law. Oh, it's no use. No use at all, I guess. Jim, please trust me. We'll find you a blanket. Try not to worry. Remember, whatever I do, whoever comes to this house, remember you'll be safe here. Old. Why did you ask me here? Uh, I'm afraid you haven't eaten very much, Simeon. He's hardly touched a thing, not even the potato pudding. Well, I... I'm upset. Forgive me for spoiling your dinner. Oh, it's all right, Simeon. I'll clear away the things. Uh, stay a while, Sophie. There's always time for a Sabbath song of grace. 
Isn't there, Simeon? I suppose so. Good. Tour Michelot. And a little less vibrato this time, Sophie. Tour Michelot. Oh, hallelujah. Excuse me. Jim. I've got some more tea. Oh, Jim, thank God you're safe. I'm safe, Master. I'm so glad to see you, Jim. I've missed you terribly. I've missed you, Master. Why did you run away from me, Jim? Didn't run away from you. No, Jim? No, sir. I run away from being a slave. Will you come back, Jim? Now, stop being a slave. Come back, Jim. Come back as a free man. You're free, Jim. Free. You mean that, Mr. Simeon? I've never lied to you, Jim. No, sir. You never lied to nobody. Oh, I, I'll be mighty glad to work for you, sir. Mighty proud. Poor they stood there in our house while Sophie and I looked down. And it was as though a hundred Sabbath candles were shining. Yet even in our radiance, I remember the words of the French philosopher, Truth, is two opposite. Four guns had fired on Fort Sumter, and the congregation Ohave Shalom, like the American states, was sundered by the war. Some of the congregation went north to put on the blue uniform. Some went south to wore Confederate gray. And Simeon Marks came to me in the synagogue to say goodbye. I am leaving tonight, Rabbi Zold. You're past the age of fighting. Why do this, Simeon? I'm a southerner, Rabbi. But you can't fight. You've just freed Jim. It's irrational. I'm not fighting for slavery. I'm fighting for the right of the South to work out its own solution. It's inconsistent with everything you've done. Maybe. The world would be pretty dull if people were always consistent. You're unfit for fighting. I know you're not well anymore. Simeon, please reconsider. I can still do things for the South. There's one way I can serve. What way, Simeon? Goodbye, Rabbi. Simeon, what way? Tell me. Goodbye, Rabbi. You won't tell me? I can't. But it's a way to help the South, that's all I can say. God bless you, Rabbi. Look after Jim for me. <laughs> The battles of Bull Run were fought, and the sick and the wounded were brought back. We tended them, men in soil blue, men in bloody gray. We tended them as best we could, and Sophie and I looked into the sightless eyes and the bleeding faces, looking for Simeon. The months passed. The war was a terrible sickness and an agony, and we continued to look and to search. Then there was an end searching. This letter come. Mr. Simeon asked me to tell you. Yes, Jim. Tell me what. He's been taken by General Meade. Taken three days ago. They let him send this letter. He's been tried. He's going to be shot. Shot? Yes, Reverend. They're going to shoot him for... Shoot him for a Confederate spy. Mr. Lincoln can see none, Rabbi. The cabinet is meeting. A man's life hangs in the balance, Mr. Hay. I must see the president. I'm sorry, Rabbi. My orders are strict. Then, please, give Mr. Lincoln a message for me. All right, I guess I can do that. You'll find paper and pen on the desk. No, give him this Bible. Let me mark this passage. Yes. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, 
but I am weak. Take this in, Mr. Hay. Take this to Mr. Lincoln. Strange you should send me a Bible, sir. Not strange, Mr. Lincoln. I counted on it. I believe you were brought up on it, sir. So was I. Mr. Lincoln, if thy friend asks thine assistance and thine enemy asks thine assistance, it is thy duty to aid thine enemy, because this is an act of self-conquest. The Bible, Rabbi? No, Mr. Lincoln, the Talmud. But perhaps you remember from the book of Proverbs. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. I remember, Rabbi. I try not to forget. Then pardon Simeon Marks. No, Rabbi. I cannot. I cannot help him. I am the leader of an army, and he is my mortal enemy. He was a competent spy for the Confederacy. We've tried for months to catch him. Rabbi War has its own justice. If this man is a good soldier, he understands that. Look, Rabbi Zola. The silk flag I have kept in this drawer for many months. A man by the name of Abraham Cohn sent it to me. The city clerk of Chicago, I believe. I think you know the Hebrew text he sewed on it. Yes, Mr. Lincoln. Have I not commanded thee, Be thou strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. I hope the Lord will also be with this spy, Rabbi Zold. I can do nothing but give you this pass to see him. I'm very sorry. Don't grieve, Rabbi Zold. Mr. Lincoln was right. War is war. It cannot be softened. I'm ready, Rabbi Zold. Jim sent this for you. My prayer shawl. Thank Jim for me. I will see him. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. You see, I remember your text. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. I hope it's true, Rabbi. Yes, Simeon. I'm a coward. I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid of pain. There's so much pain in the world. I hope something good comes out of this war, out of all the pain. I've worked for the South. But whoever wins, I pray to God it's for something better. I pray to God. And I will give thee for a covenant of the people to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Copies of the script you have just heard, as well as the talk which follows immediately, may be obtained free of cost by writing to the Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. And now we present a brief talk by Dr. Bernard J. Bamberger, Rabbi of the West End Synagogue, New York City. Dr. Bamberger. The slavery question was settled after untold suffering and bloodshed. 
But though we have settled the question of slavery, we have not settled the question of freedom, as the present war tragically testifies. We no longer buy and sell human beings, but mankind has not yet achieved the full measure of liberty. Even in this land of liberty, much remains to be accomplished, and the problem of race especially still baffles and bedevils us. It is surprising how similar are our present difficulties to those which troubled Benjamin Zolt and Simeon Marx. The differences and antagonisms between North and South have not yet disappeared. The Negro is still the victim of discrimination both in North and in South. Now as then, the discriminatory measures against the Negro are more official and unconcealed in the South, while in the North they are no less real and galling. Now as then, the Negro desires, and today he more clearly and vocally demands, not kindness, not special favors, but the same basic human rights as everyone else. Today, as 80 years ago, injustice to a single racial minority is a threat to the stability and the safety of the entire nation. Wherever the rights and liberties of any group are, threatled, no ma- are threatened, no man's rights and no man's liberties are safe. The problem of the Negro is not the only problem of race relations that disturbs the internal tranquility of our country though it is the biggest one, affecting 10% of our citizens, and perhaps the most aggravated. The teachings of religion and the security of the nation alike demand that we face and solve this question of minorities. The color of a man's skin and the texture of his hair, the country he or his grandfather came from and the church he chooses to attend must not have a bearing on his right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As a human being and as an American, He cannot be denied decent facilities for living, the education for which he is qualified, and the job for which he is fitted. It is gratifying to record that the voice of religion is being heard more and more plainly on this subject. Recently, one of the great agencies of the Christian Church has issued a magnificent manifesto on race relations, a people which has sent its fighting men thousands of miles to vindicate liberty and justice must have the ability and the will to establish a fuller measure of justice and freedom within its own borders. We must be prepared to act and to live in accordance with a sacred word spoken in the very first chapter of our Bible. God created man, man without qualification. God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. And now, O God of freedom... We thank thee that in the days just past, deliverance has come to many captives who dwelt so long in darkness. Grant that the day of full liberation may soon come, when all thy children shall praise thee as author of liberty. Amen. The script was written by Morton Wishengrad and featured Roger DeCoven as Rabbi Benjamin Zold and Rod Hendrickson as Simeon. The music was composed by Henry Brandt and conducted by Milton Catums. Cantor Robert H. Siegel was the soloist, and the speaker was Dr. Bamberger. The entire production was under the direction of Ira Avery. The Eternal Light is a public service presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. These programs are presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Copies of the script may be obtained without cost by writing to the Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Presenting Sam Jaffe in the world of Sholem Aleichem. unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statue forever in your generations. <laughs> The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light. This public service program is produced under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our story today is based on selections of Maurice Samuel's The World of Sholem Aleichem and was adapted for radio by Morton Wishingrad. Featured as Sholem Aleichem is the distinguished actor of stage and screen, Sam Jaffe. This is the story of a world that is no more. It is a pilgrimage among the cities and inhabitants of a world which only yesterday harbored the grandfathers and grandmothers of millions of Americans. One man was a mirror of that world. His name was Sholem Rabinovich, and he wrote under the pen name of Sholem Malachim. South of the city of Kiev, and east and west, the Jews of Russia lived a life that was walled in, shut off, the life of the ghetto. For them, there were many restrictions and many humiliations. But by an oversight which Germany has since corrected, the right to remain alive was not challenged. These were the places of the childhood and the manhood of Sholem Aleichem. This writer, whom critics have compared with Dickens and Balzac and Mark Twain, sang with a humorous, exuberant lyricism of the life of the poor. For Sholem Aleichem, poverty was a great calling, an art, and a career. And he called the labyrinth of slums and marketplaces by many names. But most of all, he called it Kazrilovke. This, therefore, is a pilgrimage to the world of Kazrilovke, the world of Sholem Aleichem. that worthless husband of mine. Huh? No, I haven't. He's probably on his way home through the forest. Well, why isn't he here? I'm sure I don't know. After all, you're his wife. Why bother me? You created him, didn't you? Mr. Sholem Aleichem, the writer. <laughs> a fine writer. If you had to invent a person like Tevya and a person like me, why couldn't you have invented us rich? Because God loves the poor. Never in a million years. No? No. If God loved the poor, he wouldn't make them poor. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Sholem Aleichem. Seven children you give us, and every one a girl. And Tevya nothing but a drayman, a wagon driver, earning one ruble a day. Nine people living on one ruble a day. You ought to hide your face. Don't take on so, Mrs. Tevya. After all, this is only a piece of fiction. Save your excuses, Mr. Sholem Aleichem. It is not a piece of fiction. 
It's the world of the Russian ghetto. Very well. So what of it? So what of it, he asked. My dear Mr. Sholem Aleichem, may you have a hundred estates. Yes? And on every estate, a hundred mansions. Well? And in every mansion, a hundred rooms. And in every room, a hundred beds. And may a malarial fever toss you from bed to bed. What of it, he says. Have ya! Have ya! Have ya! Isn't this the most preposterous thing you ever heard? Here I am, Sholem Aleichem, a writer. I create characters for my stories. And do you think they're pleased? They quarrel with me. They insult me to my face. If I write a line that doesn't suit them, they walk off the page himself. Or they complain to the rabbi. Tell me, did Samuel Pickwick give Mr. Dickens so much heartache? Did Tom Sawyer plague Mark Twain the way Tevye and his wife plague me? Some people are never satisfied. Yet I'll tell you a secret. I'm fond of Tevye. Listen, that's Tevye coming through the forest. He loves God with all his might and addresses him intimately with affection, irony, sympathy, reverence, and indestructible incidents. Oh! Oh! Wretched creature in the likeness of a horse. Stop! Stop, do you hear? It's time for afternoon prayers. <laughs> so, you're not such a heathen after all. You're welcome. Now be quiet. Tevya has to pray. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. I take it, O oh Lord, that thy house is somewhat more spacious than my hovel. Every day I will bless thee. On an empty stomach, naturally, this is Tevya speaking. The Lord is good to all. Suppose he forgets somebody now and then. Good Lord, hasn't he enough on his mind? Amen. Who's that? Me, Moshe. Oh. For a moment, I thought it was that heathen, my horse. You look depressed, Moshe. Well, haven't you heard? They're taking my boy into the army. Taking him for 25 years. Well, that's nothing to be depressed about. No. Not if you consider the chances sensibly. What chances? He's being taken into the army. So, one of two things can happen. Either there is a war or there isn't. If there isn't, what have you to worry about? Hmm. Hmm. Suppose there is a war? Then again, one of two things will happen. Either he'll be sent to the front or he won't. If he isn't sent to the front, why worry? But, Tevye, suppose he is sent to the front. Naturally, one of two things will happen. He'll be wounded or he won't be wounded. If he's not wounded, why worry? What if he is wounded? Well, it's still one of two things. Either he'll recover or he won't. If he recovers, what is there to worry about? Nothing. But suppose he doesn't recover. Then either he'll be buried in consecrated earth or he won't. If he's buried in consecrated earth, what is there to worry about, eh, Moshe? Tevye, you're perfectly right. Mm. I'm glad I spoke to you. Only... Yes, Moshe? Suppose he's not buried in consecrated earth. What? Suppose he falls at the front and there's no Jewish cemetery. Then it's still one of two things. Either he... What did you say? Suppose there's no consecrated earth to bury him in. Um, well, uh, well, then, Moshe, all I can say is that your son is in some fine fix. Jewish earth. A humorous fixation? Not at all. The glory of Kazrinovsky, its peculiar treasure and heritage, was the old cemetery. This piece of earth was drenched with tradition and more. For amid the dilapidated hovels, here was a clear space of green grass and flowers and shadowing trees. A man came here to forget his status in this foolish world and to ponder the realities of eternity. Besides, the cemetery, which we Jews call the Eternal House, was the one piece of land which a Jew at that time might own. Excuse me, Mr. Sholem Aleichem. Don't you like what I'm saying, Teddy? Why must we talk of dismal things? Oh, so that's your complaint. Sure. Let's talk of cheerful things. Now... Yes, Teddy? Uh, tell me, Mr. Sholem Aleichem, 
What's the latest about the cholera in Odessa? <laughs> All right, tell you. I'm a little busy now. Wait a minute. I want to tell you a story. You tell me a story? Why not, Mr. Sholem Aleikum? Is there a law against it? Well, that's impossible, Tevye. You don't even... Shh, shh. Put it down on paper. Go ahead. They lived to 120 years, riding through the forest. And around us, wolves. Hundreds, thousands of wolves. That's terrible. Tevye, what did you do? I lashed the horse. We sped toward the river. Yes? The wolves drew nearer. Nearer. We reached the river. We flew over the ice. Faster, faster. The wolves grew closer. And then... Yes, Tevye? What shall I say? In the middle of the river, the ice cracked wide open. Mm-hmm. The sled went down. Myself, my wife, the seven girls, in an instant, the wolves were on top of us. Now, what do you think God did for us? What? Why, thanks be to him who reigns in heaven, the whole story's an invention from beginning to end. You see the trouble I have with Kazrelokites and with Tevya most of all? But let us leave Tevye for a while. Let us talk about important things, like the religion of the Kajalakites. There was no division between life and faith. Religion wasn't something tacked on to life. It was life itself. Therefore, during the solemn days before the great day of Yom Kippur, the men and women of Kajalakia thought a good deal about repentance and mutual forgiveness. Especially someone like Noah Wolf, the butcher, a hard, rough man who from year's end to year's end is the terror of his customers. Thus read Noah Wolf any day of the year in his butcher shop. Reb Noah. Don't you see I'm busy? Please, Reb Noah. What do you want? Have you any fresh meat this morning? Reb Noah. Well, are you still here? Uh, have you any fresh meat this morning? Fresh meat? Certainly not. Rotten meat, crawling meat is all I deal in. What do you have? Please, Rev Noah Wolf, give me a good portion. I'll give you exactly the portion you've earned. Rev Noah, why do you talk like that? I don't know. It just comes out of me. Now stop asking so many questions. Why does everybody ask me questions? Yes, Rev Noah doesn't know why he is rough and irritable. But in the days of repentance... No wolf is as meek as one of his own slaughtered lambs. On the day before Yom Kippur, clumsy, burly Reb Noah Wolf makes the rounds of his neighbors. Yes? Oh, it's you. If I've offended you with a harsh word, forgive me. And may you have a happy year. You too, Reb Noah Wolf. May God forgive. Have a piece of cake, Reb Noah. They all do this. Reb Noah, Ezreal the fish dealer, Gaunty the Hebrew teacher... Son of the water carrier, they all make the rounds and ask forgiveness. And always the answer is... You too, Reb Israel. May God forgive. Come in and have a piece of cake. Twice a year, it is not unforgivable to take a little strong drink in Kizunitke. On the day of the rejoicing of the law, Simplis Torah... And on Purim, the day of the celebration of Esther's triumph over Haman. Do your good health, Nevia. Drink it down. A Kazrill of Kite talking of drinks puts you in mind of Vikings draining gigantic flagons. A Kazrill of Kite actually drinking is much less formidable. Drink, everyone. Cursed be Mordecai. Cursed be Haman. The first, Thimbleful brings a joyous light into his eyes. The second, Thimbleful sets him dancing. The third, Thimbleful extinguishes him. Three healthy peasants can drink at one sitting all the brandy consumed on Purim and Kazrilitke and walk home erect. But there are other ways of celebrating. There is the Purim play, which brings us to the tally with the legs. I, Naftali, as always, will play Mamuchen. You, Beryl, will play Queen Esther. You, Chaim, will play Mordecai. You, Solomon, Najwaris. But I, Naftali, with the legs, I play the King's Chamberlain, Memuchen. You play Memuchen every year. Give someone else a chance. That's right, Naftali. How about me? You? That's right, me. Don't make me laugh. Look at your legs. Short. Look at mine. Nice and long. The longest legs in Kazulipke. I play Memuchen. What have the legs to do with it? Hmm? (laughs) 
Who carries the message of our joyous to Queen Vashti? Mamukhan. Who brings back the stupefying answer? Mamukhan. With whom does our joyous take counsel? Mamukhan. Who is the ambassador to Mordecai? Mamukhan. You see, it's Mamukhan here, Mamukhan there, Mamukhan everywhere. And Mamukhan with short legs is a calamity in a poor in play. I, Naftali with the legs, I play Mamukhan. <laughs> Thus, you see, in Kazrithke, the religion of the inhabitants is inseparable from their daily lives. And yet, they never speak of religion. It is something understood, like being human. They had nothing to be good with except religion, and nothing to be bad with except religion. And among their prayers was one which went, O oh Lord, let me worship thee not only with my good inclination, but also with my evil inclination. Humor in Kisritke was tinctured with this same feeling. The jokes had a savor of the Torah, or else a flavor of the Talmud. Thus Tevye, a man of few letters, nevertheless could argue with, with his wife in Talmudic style. My cousin Menachem Mendel was here. I don't want to hear about him. Tevye, why not? First, because he's a shlamil. He's the kind of a man who starves all day and dreams of hot soup at night, but doesn't have a spoon. Maybe. But if there's a first reason, what's the second? Menachem is a Luftmensch. You know what a Luftmensch is. A man who starves by his wits. Ah, to hear you talk, someone would think you like rich people. Me? Are you crazy? Let it be understood that the first thing I look for in a man is a little learning. I say that an ignoramus is worse than a hooligan. Leave your head uncovered, walk on your hands like a lunatic, that's your business. But as long as you know what's doing between the covers of a book, you're my kind. If on top of that you happen to be a rich man, I consider it a minor defect. Do you see what Teddy is? A pauper of paupers, but a descendant of martyrs and scholars. He cannot abide ignorance and grossness in human beings. He will not even admit that poverty and oppression are adequate excuses for utter want of spiritual interest. But have you, this much is implied in being a Jew. There was another symbol of Kishulitje, Reb Yosifel. Reb Yosifel the rabbi. To say that he was a scholar and a saint is but to give him his formal due. He was the conscience of Kasrilivki, its purer self and its suffering heart. He did not believe in the sin of others. He saw only childishness and error. No man in his view was wicked by choice. It was all misunderstanding. So when Rip Samson, the father of Meyer and Schneier, died and left no inheritance other than a seat beside the eastern wall of the synagogue, a seat beside Rip Yosef himself, Meyer and Schneier quarreled for the inheritance. This was understandable, since Meyer and Schneier were twins. The seat belongs to me. I was born before you. Prove it. Who can prove that you're Meyer and I'm Schneier? Suppose they mixed us up when we were infants? My dear Schneier, may you live to be 120 years, but the seat belongs to me. We'll see about that. Don't try any funny business, Schneier. I'll remind you of the same, Meyer. Is that so? Well, we'll see what we shall see. Remember, I'm warning you. An impasse. Neither Meyer nor Schneier would retreat an inch. It became a scandal. There were arguments and even blows. There was nothing else to do than lay the matter before Red Yosef. There was argument and rebuttal. Schneier spoke, Meyer spoke, their wives, hangers on, innumerable neutrals on the side of Meyer, innumerable neutrals on the side of Schneier. And Red Yosef listened, and as always with a sweet, patient smile. Well, Reb Yosifel? We're waiting for your decision, Reb Yosifel. I have reached a conclusion. Well? You're both right. 
What kind of a decision is that? Quiet. Uh, you shall both sit by the eastern wall of the synagogue. But there's only one seat, which is mine. Uh, my... There are two seats. One of you shall have your father's seat. The other one shall have mine. But, Reb Yosefel, you're the rabbi. Where in what chapter and verse is it written that I, Reb Yosefel, must occupy a seat by the eastern wall of the old synagogue? No, Rabbi. Please, let us consider the matter. What is a synagogue? It's a holy place. Why do we go to a synagogue? To utter prayer. To whom? To the supreme judge. Where is the supreme judge? The earth is filled with his glory. And if the earth is filled with his glory, what matters east or west or north or south in the synagogue? <laughs> what matters the eastern wall or the standing place by the door? The palace of the Lord is not an arena for this fight. I have rendered judgment. You will both sit by the wall. I shall stand. <laughs> When the Sabbath came round, there was a strange spectacle. Both Meyer and Schneier were stationed at the door among the, the poor and the humble. They could not be persuaded to take their seats by the eastern wall, seeing which the Yosefer resumed his place by the ark, and Meyer and Schneier stood on their feet until the services were over. So it was the following Sabbath, and the Sabbath after that, as long as Meyer and Schneier lived. And the seat remained forever vacant beside the eastern wall of the old, old synagogue of Kazulitki. Why was the Sabbath so important? If you ask this of Tevye, he would marvel at your ignorance. Why does a man work a whole week? You work a whole week to reach the Sabbath and to celebrate it. Go on, Tevye. I tell you, a man wouldn't know what to do if God hadn't given us the Sabbath. A gift. A real gift out of his grace. When the Sabbath comes, I'm a different man, you hear? I dance home after a bath. And there on the table are the two old brass candlesticks, shining like stars, if you know what I mean. And the two big Sabbath loaves. There, right beside them, are the winking Sabbath fish. Sending out a smell that takes you by the throat. And the house is warm and bright and fresh and clean in every corner. Then what do you do, Teddy? What a question. I sit down like a king and open the good book and go twice over the week's portion. Then I'm off to the synagogue. And what a homecoming after that. The benediction by candlelight. The drop of good kiddish wine that sings right through me, if you know what I mean. And then the fish and the golden soup and the yellow carrots and honey... Ah, that night I sleep like a lord. And in the morning to the synagogue again. And after the Sabbath meal, a nap. Then back to the good book, as fresh as a giant. And off you go, chapter after chapter, eh? Psalm after psalm, at, at the gallop, like the mileposts on the road, if you know what I mean. Yismechu, yismechu, b'malchus to the world of Kisulitki, the Sabbath was something very dear. A faint foretaste of the sweetness of paradise. In the afternoon, the children are quiet. Father sleeps the sacred sleep of the Sabbath afternoon. The marketplace is deserted. No peasants, no traders, no horses, no goats, no bleating, no brain. Shh. Quiet. You must be at peace. You must have Sabbath within you. Body and spirit must know the tranquility and holiness of the day ordained at Sinai. The Sabbath siesta is not a long affair. <clears throat> Good. Who wants to sleep away the loveliest of days? Half an hour passes, an hour at most. Then you hear issuing from the dilapidated houses and hanging over the crooked alleys Sweet, haunting melodies in the minor key. The vague, 
turned, half phrases, words and half words, repeated over and over again. Melancholy, but not depressed. The voices linger over the townlet with the tenderness of bells. Melody words and half words, the grace notes that say nothing and say everything. And meanwhile, the Sabbath is slipping away. The Sabbath queen is preparing her departure. The harsh world, the daily struggle, the bitterness of life, stand at the gates of the evening. Get everything you can out of this heavenly interlude. Then the moment of separation from the Sabbath comes, and the Kasrilokite takes regretful leave and sings his song in homely Yiddish. Where are the Sabbaths and festivals of old Kazwilovki? The ancient setting no longer exists. The worlds of Sholomalation and Tevya are gone. The place where they lived has been harrowed by the fire of two great wars and a revolution. Now in America it is different. And all the surviving Kazrilovkites, the traditionalists and modernists alike, remember now and again with a nostalgic pang the far-off magic of those sacred hours, those transfigured interludes of the Sabbaths and festivals for which even progress and freedom have found no substitutes. The script you have just heard is based on Marie Samuel's book, The World of Sholem Alechem. We wish to acknowledge the courtesy of the author and Alfred A. Knopf, publisher, for permission to use this material. Free copies of the script may be obtained by writing to the Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. The Eternal Light is written by Morton Wishengrad. The music is composed by Henry Brandt and conducted by Milton Catons. The soloist is Cantor Robert H. Siegel of the Beacon Street Temple in Brookline, Massachusetts. Featured today were Sam Jaffe as Sholem Aleichem and Jackson Beck as Tevya. The entire production was under the direction of Ira Avery. Copies of the script may be obtained free of cost by writing to the Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This program is presented as a public service by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. The program was prepared under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This program came to you from our Radio City studios in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. In Psalm 63, David said, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. To help you focus your thoughts upon God at the close of this day, we bring you this devotional meditation from Morning and Evening by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the 19th century. 
This evening's text comes from Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for Thee. At the very time when the Chaldeans surrounded Jerusalem, and when the sword, famine, and pestilence had desolated the land, Jeremiah was commanded by God to purchase a field and have the transfer legally sealed and witnessed. This was a strange purchase for a rational man to make. Prudence could not justify it, for it was buying with scarcely a probability that the person purchasing could ever enjoy the possession. But it was enough for Jeremiah that his God had bidden him, for well he knew that God will be justified of all his children. He reasoned thus, Ah, Lord God, Thou canst make this plot of ground of use to me. Thou canst rid this land of these oppressors. Thou canst make me yet sit under my vine and my fig tree in the heritage which I have bought. For Thou didst make the heavens and the earth, and there is nothing too hard for Thee. This gave a majesty to the early saints, that they dared to do at God's command things which carnal reason would condemn. Whether it be a Noah who is to build a ship on dry land, an Abraham who is to offer up his only son, or a Moses who is to despise the treasures of Egypt, or a Joshua who is to besiege Jericho seven days, using no weapons but the blasts of ram's horns, they all act upon God's command, contrary to the dictates of carnal reason. And the Lord gives them a rich reward as a result of their obedient faith. Would to God we had in the religion of these modern times a more potent infusion of this heroic faith in God. If we would venture more upon the naked promise of God, we should enter a world of wonders to which as yet we are strangers. Let Jeremiah's place of confidence be ours. Nothing is too hard for the God that created the heavens and the earth. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each evening at this same time for Morning and Evening.